ready hmm. then ready yes so a very good evening everyone and i welcome you all to the part 2 remarkable rapid revision of the general medicine so yesterday like we had the part 1 session of remarkable rapid revision of general medicine and the pdf of the remarkable rapid session part 1 it is available on my instagram handle right and my instagram handle is rajesh gubba so on my instagram handle in the link is given in my bio so you can just download that link or you can open the link where you will get the pdf of part 1 okay so having said this right so having said this let us start with the part 2 discussion so today i'll try to revise the uh, neurology the pulmonology then connective tissue disorders and then nephrology and then subsequently gastroenterology so now let us start with the neurology first so i repeat again so for all the students who want the pdf of the yesterday's class you can just visit my instagram handle that is rajesh gubba so in the instagram handle like in the link is given in the bio wherein you can download the pdf of the yesterday's session and even the today's session also after the completion of the session i will just keep the link in the bio of my instagram handle that is rajesh gubba so you can download that pdf which will be definitely useful for your final revision of the fmg exam so having said this let us start with the neurology revision so the first topic in the neurology will be the glen barre syndrome so quickly answer this question right so glen barre syndrome is demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system demyelinating disorder of the peripheral nervous system both axonal neuropathy so what exactly is your glen barre syndrome any one of you please so what type of disorder is your glen barre syndrome glen barre syndrome it is an autoimmune disorder okay and it is an autoimmune disorder where the antibodies are formed against the peripheral nervous system okay very good the antibodies are formed against the peripheral nervous system and it is what type of the hypersensitivity reaction is another important question related to glen barre syndrome so it is a delayed hypersensitivity reaction so when we are using the word delayed hypersensitivity reaction what type of hypersensitivity reaction will be will be this it is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction this is a very very important question now antibodies are actually formed against the microorganisms now among the microorganisms you see this question which of the following is the most common antecedent infection associated with the glen barre syndrome mycoplasma epstein barr virus chlamydia infection campylobacter jejuni so the most common antecedent infection very good so the most common antecedent infection which is associated with the glen barre syndrome is the campylobacter jejuni and this campylobacter jejuni is associated with the gastrointestinal manifestations and in the clinical feature you should know what is the earliest manifestation in the glen barre syndrome distal areflexia facial nerve involvement acute flaccid paralysis urinary incontinence so what do you think is the earliest manifestation in glen barre syndrome any one of you right so please remember the earliest manifestation in glen barre syndrome will be distal areflexia 
So, which particular deep tendon reflex is lost? That is, the ankle jerk is being lost. That will be the earliest manifestation. And after the loss of the ankle jerk, all the deep tendon reflexes will be lost and the individual will have classic paralysis of all the four limbs. And the characteristic description of the paralysis in guillain barre syndrome is what? It is ascending paralysis. Okay. So, what type of paralysis is that? It is ascending paralysis. So, that is what you will have in patients with the guillain barre syndrome. Now, the next important point is, these patients with the guillain barre syndrome, ultimately, they will die because of the respiratory failure. Hmm? They die because of respiratory failure. So, what type of respiratory failure? What type of respiratory failure do you see in case of the guillain barre syndrome? Type 1 respiratory failure, type 2, type 3 and type 4 respiratory failure. Which type of respiratory failure do you see? Right. So, whenever there is respiratory muscle paralysis, the type of respiratory failure that you will see in guillain barre syndrome is type 2 respiratory failure. And in patients with the guillain barre syndrome, there is also involvement of the cranial nerve. And which is the cranial nerve that is affected in guillain barre syndrome? It is the seventh nerve which is being affected and that too bilateral facial nerve palsy will be there. And there will be also disturbance of autonomic function and because of disturbance of autonomic function, the individual will present with postural hypotension, right, where upon standing, the individual will have fall in the blood pressure, okay, postural hypotension will be there. And you have the four important forms of guillain barre syndrome and you need to know which is the most common form of the guillain barre syndrome. Acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, miller fischer syndrome, acute motor axonal neuropathy and acute sensory motor axonal neuropathy. So, can anyone quickly answer what is the most common form of guillain barre syndrome? The most common form of guillain barre syndrome, please remember, it is your AIDP. That is acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. That is the most common form. And which is the rare form of your guillain barre syndrome? It is the miller fischer syndrome, which is a rare form. And you see this question. See the question properly. Most commonly affected cranial nerve in the Miller Fisher syndrome is most commonly affected cranial nerve in case of Miller Fisher syndrome is seventh nerve, third nerve, sixth nerve, tenth nerve. So, which particular cranial nerve is affected in Miller Fisher syndrome? So, in Guillain Barre syndrome, it is your seventh nerve. But in case of Miller Fisher syndrome, it is your oculomotor nerve, which is the third nerve. Okay. And what did we discuss in Guillain Barre syndrome? The earliest manifestation will be distal areflexia. But in case of the Miller Fisher syndrome, the cranial nerves are affected first. Right? The cranial nerves are affected first. Okay. And which cranial nerve is that? That is the third cranial nerve. That is oculomotor nerve which is affected first. Okay. And these individuals with Miller Fisher syndrome, they are characterized by a triad. And what is a triad in Miller Fisher syndrome? Just remember it as OAA. What is this OAA? That is ophthalmoplegia, right? A reflexia, where there will be absence of the reflexes. And then they will also have ataxia. Okay. So, this is what is your OAA, which is a triad in case of Miller Fisher syndrome. And you should also know what is the antibody, what is the investigation of choice in Miller Fisher syndrome. The investigation of choice in Miller Fisher syndrome will be anti GQ1 antibody. That is what is seen in case of the Miller Fisher syndrome, right? Then, followed by that, how will be the prognosis in patients with the Miller Fisher syndrome? So, the prognosis in Miller, sorry, prognosis in case of guillain barre syndrome, it will be the good prognosis. Within almost 4 to, four to 8 weeks, the individual will recover back. And, but the only thing, the recovery will occur in reverse fashion. That means the upper limb will recover first, then trunk muscles and then lower limb muscles will recover last. And what the very important is the investigation of choice in case of guillain barre syndrome. Investigation of choice in case of guillain barre syndrome will be anti-GM1 antibody. That will be the investigation of choice. Okay. Right. And what will be the CSF finding in patients with the guillain barre syndrome? You have a classical picture that is called albuminocytological dissociation. 
right albumino cytological dissociation that will be the csf picture in patients with the glen barre syndrome and investigation of choice is what anti gm1 antibody and next you need to know what is the drug of choice so can anyone tell me what is the drug of choice in these patients with the glen barre syndrome the drug of choice in case of glen barre syndrome will be intravenous immunoglobulin that will be the drug of choice in case of glen barre syndrome and another treatment option for your glen barre syndrome will be plasma pharesis right plasma pharesis so both of them they are equally efficacious but the drug of choice is considered to be the intravenous immunoglobulin so this completes the discussion of the quick discussion of the glen barre syndrome and the next important topic is a neuromuscular junction disorder that is myasthenia gravis now you see this a question quickly all of the following are neuromuscular junction disorders except which of the following is not a neuromuscular junction disorder lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome botulism congenital myasthenia tetanus yes so please remember the one which is not the neuromuscular junction disorder it is your tetanus tetanus is not a neuromuscular junction disorder now our point of discussion is about myasthenia so if you see this uh, topic of myasthenia myasthenia is caused by dysfunction of pineal gland thymus gland pituitary gland parathyroid gland so what do you think is the answer so please remember myasthenia gravis it is mainly due to dysfunction of the thymus gland and you need to know what are the thymic abnormalities the thymic abnormalities we have two important thymic abnormalities that includes thymic hyperplasia which is seen in almost 65% of patients and thymoma which is seen in almost 10% of patients so please remember thymic abnormalities that to thymic hyperplasia is most common okay right now what are the features of the myasthenia gravis myasthenia gravis is associated with decreased acetylcholine at the nerve endings decreased myosin absent troponin c decreased myoneural junction transmission so in myasthenia gravis the acetylcholine levels they will be normal at the nerve endings but the problem is that the nm receptors are occupied by the antibodies and that is the reason why there will be decreased myoneural junction transmission that is what is the answer in case of myasthenia gravis and please remember these patients with myasthenia gravis they have the hla association can anyone tell me what is the hla association in myasthenia gravis right the hla association in case of the myasthenia gravis will be hla b8 that will be the hla association in myasthenia gravis and we also have hla dr w3 that is another important hla association in myasthenia gravis and these myasthenia gravis it's what now it's an autoimmune disorder so it is associated with other autoimmune disorders what are those other associated autoimmune disorders like graves and it is also associated with rheumatoid arthritis and it is also associated with systemic lupus erythematosus which is also an autoimmune disorder next now followed by that you see another important question on myasthenia gravis all are the clinical features of myasthenia gravis except spontaneous remission absent deep tendon reflexes proximal muscle involvement worsened by exertion so myasthenia gravis once these individuals they take rest there will be spontaneous remission of the activity and proximal muscle involvement will be there in patients with myasthenia gravis compared to that of the distal muscles and the weakness in myasthenia gravis it get worsened by exertion and remember the absent deep tendon reflexes they are not the feature of myasthenia gravis in case of myasthenia gravis the deep tendon reflexes will be normal okay so absent deep tendon reflexes is not the feature of the myasthenia gravis and which are all the muscles which are affected what is the earliest manifestation in case of myasthenia gravis see the earliest manifestation in patients with myasthenia gravis will be ptosis mostly it is asymmetrical ptosis occasionally it can be bilateral also but mostly it is asymmetrical ptosis and this will be the earliest manifestation in patients with the myasthenia gravis 
and what are the other muscles which are affected apart from the levator see why is this ptosis this ptosis it is mainly due to involvement of the levator palpebrae superioris muscle what are the other muscles which are affected muscles of mastication due to which the individual will have weakness while chewing facial muscles and due to which the individual will have abnormal facial expression whenever they smile and that is called myasthenic snarl the individual that is called myasthenic snarl and the muscles of deglutition are affected because of which the individual will have dysphagia so these are the muscles which are affected in patients with myasthenia gravis and not only that there is also involvement of flexors and extensors of the neck and because of the involvement of flexors and extensors of the neck the individual can have neck drop dropping of the neck okay so this is about the muscle involvement in patients with myasthenia gravis now i'll ask you a quick question so we have a 50 year old male presents with complaining of ptosis difficulty in chewing occasional difficulty in swallowing there is no history of diplopia or visual loss on examination there is asymmetrical ptosis mild restriction of extraocular muscles with finger abduction test 60 degrees nerve conduction study shows decremental response in orbicularis only and electroretinography reveals a myopathic pattern antibodies are negative what do you think is the most probable diagnosis in this case what do you think is the diagnosis in this case right so please remember this very very important point it is not ocular myasthenia gravis it is generalized myasthenia gravis why because in ocular myasthenia gravis you have only ocular involvement right there will be only ocular involvement okay in generalized myasthenia gravis apart from ocular involvement you have other manifestation as well so the individual is having difficulty in chewing the individual is having difficulty in swallowing so you will not have that right you will not have that in case of the ocular myasthenia gravis okay so in ocular myasthenia gravis only ocular manifestation will be there and it is characterized by a triad so what is a triad the triad include the ptosis there will be diplopia right and there will be also orbicularis oculi weakness right orbicularis oculi weakness so only ocular manifestations will be there in case of ocular myasthenia gravis and what will be the investigation of choice here the antibodies that you will have is anti musk antibodies and how do you treat these patients with ocular myasthenia gravis we need to give steroids okay so because it's an autoimmune disorder right next then what is the investigation of choice in case of the myasthenia gravis what do you think is the most sensitive test for diagnosis of myasthenia gravis elevated ach receptor antibody repetitive nerve stimulation test positive edrophonium test measurement of jitter by single fiber electromyography so what do you think is the investigation right so na 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 it is not the antibody it is the single fiber electromyography that is the right that is the investigation of choice because if you take the investigations these are the four investigations antibodies repetitive nerve stimulation single fiber electromyography and edrophonium test but among all these the sensitivity is highest for single fiber electromyography for single fiber electromyography the sensitivity is highest okay right then what about this tensilon test whenever you give tensilon what is tensilon it is nothing but edrophonium so whenever you give tensilon there will be disappearance of the ptosis right there will be disappearance of the ptosis but only one uh, one quick thing that you have to take care is when you are giving when you are doing this edrophonium test the individual may develop bradycardia because your tensilon or edrophonium will increase the acetylcholine levels so you have to keep atropine ready whenever you are doing this tensilon test okay next another important test for myasthenia gravis is the ice pack test so when you are doing this ice pack ice pack test is for what 
it is for the myasthenia gravis and whenever you place an ice pack over the ptosis right whenever you place the ice pack over the ptosis what will happen to the ptosis the ptosis will disappear that is what is your ice pack test and finally what is the treatment for myasthenia gravis what is the drug of choice for myasthenia gravis please remember it is acetylcholine receptor inhibitors and that is your pyridostigmine so pyridostigmine is the drug of choice but whereas that is for mild myasthenia gravis but whereas in case of moderate to severe form of myasthenia gravis what we give is steroids right what we give is steroids okay that is about your uh, myasthenia gravis and one point related to myasthenia gravis is you need to know about myasthenic crisis myasthenic crisis is that where the individual will develop respiratory failure and they will die because of your type 2 respiratory failure and how is this myasthenic crisis treated the myasthenic crisis is best managed with intravenous immunoglobulin or plasma pharesis right managed with intravenous immunoglobulin or plasma pharesis whereas in myasthenia gravis we give steroids but for myasthenic crisis where there is development of respiratory failure that is best managed with the intravenous immunoglobulins and what about thymectomy yes thymectomy should be done in all cases of myasthenia gravis and what should be the age group when you are doing thymectomy the age group at which you will do thymectomy is around 15 to 55 years so when the age group of the individual is in between 15 to 55 years you can go ahead with the thymectomy okay so that is about your myasthenia gravis and one more neuromuscular junction disorder is what that is lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome which of which one of the following is correct regarding lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome it commonly affects the ocular muscles neostigmine is the drug of choice repetitive electrical stimulation enhances the muscle power and it is commonly associated with adenocarcinoma of the lung so what do you think is the correct statement with lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome any one of you right so if you take lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome it commonly affects ocular muscles is a wrong statement it is the proximal muscles which are more commonly affected then compared to that of you are the ocular muscles whereas in myasthenia ocular muscles are commonly affected and neostigmine is not the drug of choice for lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome it is 3,4 diamino pyrimidine which is the drug of choice and what is the investigation of choice that is repetitive nerve stimulation will show you incremental response that will be the uh, investigation of choice and it is commonly associated with adenocarcinoma it is an incorrect statement it is commonly associated with the small cell carcinoma of the lung right it is commonly associated with the small cell carcinoma of the lung so that is about your lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome and what is the difference between myasthenia and lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome is myasthenia it is a post synaptic defect whereas lambert eaton it is the pre synaptic defect and in myasthenia antibodies are formed against the acetylcholine receptors which are present on post synaptic nerve terminal whereas in lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome the antibodies are formed against the calcium channels which are present on pre synaptic nerve terminal so myasthenia is a post synaptic nerve terminal disorder lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome it is a pre synaptic nerve terminal disorder okay so these are the major differences between these two and drug of choice is what 3,4 diaminopyrimidine that we give in case of Lambert Eaton myasthenics, right? Next. So, after having discussed about the neuromuscular junction disorders, the next important is the brainstem stroke syndromes. In the cerebrovascular accidents, what is very important is brainstem stroke syndromes. Okay. Now, so we have midbrain stroke syndromes, pontine syndromes, and then medullary stroke syndrome. Now, let us discuss about the midbrain stroke syndrome first. So, there are totally five midbrain stroke syndromes, and what are those? All of the following are true about Weber syndrome, except the question is except. Any one of you? All of the following are true about Weber syndrome, except 
ipsilateral oculomotor nerve palsy, diplopia, contralateral hemiplegia, ipsilateral facial nerve palsy. So, the question is very simple. When I am using the word midbrain, in the midbrain, you don't have the facial nerve. Okay. So, in order to have the facial nerve palsy, right, in order to have facial nerve palsy, it should be a pontine stroke syndrome. Right, it should be a pontine stroke syndrome. Now, let me tell you what are all your midbrain stroke syndromes. Just remember the names. Names are very, very important. What are those that includes? Weber syndrome is one of the midbrain stroke syndrome. Benedict syndrome, midbrain stroke syndrome, Claude syndrome, Perinod syndrome, and one more midbrain stroke syndrome is the North Nagel syndrome. Okay. So, you just remember the names, they are very, very important. They will definitely ask you which among the following is not a midbrain stroke syndrome. So, you need to remember the names Weber's, Benedict's, Claude's, Perinod's, North Nagel. They are all midbrain stroke syndrome. Okay, then now a quick question on the Benedict syndrome. Benedict syndrome, all are true except which among the following is not the feature of Benedict syndrome. So, just now, what did I tell you? Your Benedict syndrome, is it a midbrain stroke syndrome or a pontine syndrome? Just now, we have discussed that Weber's, Benedict's, Claude's, North Nagel, Perinod's, they are all midbrain stroke syndromes. So, Benedict's, the lesion at the level of pons, that will be the wrong state. So, Benedict's is not a pontine syndrome. Benedict's is what? Benedict's is a midbrain stroke syndrome. Okay, next. Now, let us discuss about the Pontine syndromes. So, if you take the Pontine syndrome, one among that is Millard Gubler syndrome. Millard Gubler syndrome includes the following, except which among the following is not the feature of the Millard Gubler syndrome? Fifth nerve palsy, sixth nerve palsy, contralateral hemiparesis. So, yes, any one of you? Right. In case of the Millard Gubler syndrome, you don't have the involvement of the fifth nerve. You don't have the involvement of the fifth nerve. It is the sixth, seventh, and corticospinal tract. And you should know what are the names of the pontine syndromes. So these are the pontine syndromes. Number one, Millard Gubler syndrome, where there is involvement of six, seven, and corticospinal tract. Then lower dorsal pontine syndrome is a foveal syndrome. And then upper dorsal pontine syndrome will be a Raymond Sestan syndrome. And one more pontine syndrome we have. That is the logged in syndrome, right? That is logged in syndrome. In logged in syndrome, everything is gone. Only vertical eye movement will be left out. The remaining entire body is paralyzed. And it is a bilateral ventral pontine syndrome. Only vertical eye movement is preserved. Everything is lost. Quadriplegia, unable to speak, right? Horizontal movement, eye movement is limited. There will be only vertical eye movement, but consciousness is also preserved. Okay, these are the pontine syndromes. So, what are pontine syndromes? Repeat with me: Millard Gubler, Powell, Raymond Sestan syndrome, and Logged in syndrome. Okay, right. Now, a quick question here. Okay, so answer this question: A 65-year-old diabetic patient develops weakness in the left side of the face right arm and right leg. She also has diplopia of the left gaze. So, what is the site of lesion? What is the site of lesion? Any one of you please? Yes. Where will be the site of lesion? Right pons, left pons, right midbrain, left midbrain. Okay, now you see the structures, how do I divide this? So, the individual is having right arm and right leg weakness. So, corticospinal tract gone. The individual is having diplopia on the left gaze. That means the sixth nerve is gone, right? And the individual is having the weakness of the left side of the face. That means the facial nerve is gone. So, there will be ipsilateral cranial nerve involvement, contralateral corticospinal tract involvement. So, where will be the site of lesion now? The site of lesion, very good, uh, Mayank and Irfan. So, the answer will be the left pons. The answer will be left pons. 
So what will be this? It is nothing but your Miller-Bugler syndrome, which is a Pontine syndrome. Okay, which is a Pontine syndrome. Next, now let us discuss the medullary syndromes, medullary stroke syndromes. Lateral medullary syndrome is caused by thrombosis of which vessel? Ica, pica, vertebral artery, basilar artery. Yes. Lateral medullary syndrome is caused by thrombosis of. Right. Remember, yes, it is your vertebral artery followed by that pica. Right. And what is another name for your lateral medullary syndrome? The another name for lateral medullary syndrome, it is also called as Wallenberg syndrome. Right, it is also called Wallenberg syndrome. And similarly, you also have medial medullary syndrome. So, what are your, what is the other name for medial medullary syndrome? The other name for your medial medullary syndrome, it is called Dejerine syndrome. Right, it is called Dejerine syndrome. And you should not get confused with the Dejerine Rossi syndrome. Dejerine Rossi syndrome, it is your thalamic syndrome. Whereas Dejerine syndrome will be medial medullary syndrome. And in this medial medullary syndrome, what is the vessel that is affected? That is the anterior spinal artery. Right? It is the anterior spinal artery which is affected in case of the medial medullary syndrome. So that was about your brainstem stroke syndrome. So midbrain stroke syndromes, then pontine syndromes, and then medullary syndromes. So please repeat with me all these syndromes now. What are your midbrain stroke syndromes? Weber's, Benedict's, Claude's, Perinod's, and North Nagel syndrome. And what are your Pontine syndromes? Millard Gubler, Povil syndrome, Raymond Sestan syndrome, and then Locked in syndrome. And what are medullary syndromes? Medial medullary syndrome is Dejerine syndrome. Lateral medullary syndrome is Wallenberg syndrome. Wallenberg syndrome, the vessel most commonly affected is vertebral artery and Dejerine syndrome, the vessel most commonly affected is anterior spinal artery. So, brainstem stroke syndromes are very, very important part of your exam. Okay, you should definitely revise this before going to the exams. Okay, next. Then, yes, you see this clinical question. A middle-aged patient presents with worst headache of life. What is the investigation of choice? So the next next things we will go on to the discussion of the stroke. So yes, worst headache of the life. The description is nothing but subarachnoid hemorrhage. And what will be the investigation of choice in case of subarachnoid hemorrhage? It is your CT brain. CT brain is the investigation of choice in case of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And you should know what is the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage. The most common cause of the subarachnoid hemorrhage will be the head trauma. And can anyone tell me what is the second most common cause? The second most common cause is the rupture of berry aneurysms. Right? Rupture of the berry aneurysms. And what is the most common site of berry aneurysm? The most common site of berry aneurysm will be at the junction of anterior cerebral artery with the anterior communicating artery. And what will be the CSF finding in case of subarachnoid hemorrhage? The CSF finding will be xanthochromia, where the blood will get mixed with the CSF and thereby it will give you orange yellow colored appearance, which is nothing but xanthochromia. And in subarachnoid hemorrhage, whenever you do a CT brain, what is the finding that you will have? Remember, it should be a non-contrast CT scan. It should not be contrast enhanced. It should be non-contrast. So, you will have the presence of blood within the sylvian fissure. Right? You will have the presence of blood in the sylvian fissure. Okay? See, oligoclonal bands, they are not seen in case of your subarachnoid hemorrhage. Where do you see oligoclonal bands? Where do you see oligoclonal bands? Oligoclonal bands, any one of you? Oligoclonal bands, they are the characteristic feature in patients with the multiple sclerosis. Hmm? Multiple sclerosis. It is not your the uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then, how do you treat these patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage? It all depends upon whether is there any midline shift present or not. 
And what is the calcium channel blocker that we give in these individuals? The calcium channel blocker that we give is nimodipine. Okay. And what is the purpose of giving nimodipine? That is mainly to prevent the vasospasm and to prevent the ischemia, we give this nimodipine. That was about your subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then you see another important clinical question. A middle-aged uh, patient presents with history of the left-sided weakness for two days. Currently, the patient is extremely drowsy and underwent a CT brain. Which of the following is the best treatment for this patient? Aspirin or clopidogrel? Mechanical thrombectomy should be done. Manitol should be given. Decompressive craniotomy. Okay. So, this is the CT brain of the patient. Right. So, if you closely observe, right, if you closely observe there, what is that you are seeing? You are observing that there is a midline shift. You are observing that there is a midline shift. Now, what is this you are having? It is the presence of a large hypodense lesion. Right? It is a presence of a large hypodense lesion. And exactly in the which territory is this large hypodense lesion? This large hypodense lesion, it is present in the MCA territory. Now, our patient is having a midline shift. So, whenever there is a midline shift, what will be the best treatment? The best treatment will be the decompressive craniotomy should be done. Right? Decompressive craniotomy should be done. Then what about this mechanical thrombectomy and story of the others? You take mechanical thrombectomy. Mechanical thrombectomy should be done in case of when the patient presents within 8 hours. But our patient is having this particular weakness since almost 2 days. So, there is no role of mechanical thrombectomy. Right? And it is a large hypodense lesion with a midline shift. So, you have to do a decompressive craniotomy in this clinical scenario. Okay? Next. Then, so I hope everyone is comfortable with the discussion. Yes? All of you, are you happy with the discussion which is going on? Is there any problem? Any correction to be done? Right. Then, we will move on to the next question. What is the window period of thrombolysis in a stroke patient? What is the window period? Yes. So, the window period of thrombolysis in a stroke patient is what? It is 4.5 hours. Right. And what is the thrombolytic agent which you will be using? The thrombolytic agent that you will be using is tissue plasminogen activator. And what are all the various indications for thrombolysis? The indications for thrombolysis is the, the individual should be presenting within 4.5 hours of ischemic stroke. That is one important criteria. And age of the patient should be more than 18 years. Less than 18 years, don't do thrombolysis. Okay. And the next important indication is there should be no hemorrhage or edema. Right? There should be no hemorrhage or edema of more than one third of MCA territory. Why? See, if, the, if there is like more than one third of MCA territory, if there is hypodense lesion, you should not do thrombolysis. What will happen? This ischemia, it can turn into hemorrhage if you do thrombolysis when the hypodense lesion, if it is present in more than one third of MCA territory. So, the, this word is very, very important. CT scan showing no hemorrhage or no edema of more than one third of MCA territory. If you do, what will happen? If there is ischemia like more than one third, can you do thrombolysis? No. If you do thrombolysis, that, that will get converted into hemorrhage. So, please remember, you should not do. Okay. These are the indications for the, and what should be the blood pressure? The blood pressure should be less than 160 by 90 before doing thrombolysis. And if it is like more than 180 or like more than 110 diastolic blood pressure, it's a contraindication for thrombolysis. Okay. Next. So, another important question on the topic of stroke, which of the following complication of the stroke need not be treated? Fever, spasticity, neglect dysphagia. Which of the following complication of the stroke need not be treated?
yes right so please remember the one which does not require treatment is the neglect okay neglect now what about the other options okay first of all what is this particular neglect why does it occur see this neglect it occurs mainly due to blockade of the inferior division of the middle cerebral artery right it is mainly due to blockade of inferior division of middle cerebral artery you have the development of this hemi neglect and where will be the site of lesion for the development of neglect it is non dominant parietal lobe and what will be that non dominant parietal lobe that is the right parietal lobe and in these patients with neg hemi neglect see this hemi neglect it is also called as what it is also called somatognosia right somatognosia so in these individuals with hemi neglect like what will be the problem right what will be the problem in these individuals is the individual will consider only one half the body is present the other half he will neglect and that is what is called hemi neglect or spatial agnosia so why will this develop that is due to blockade of inferior division of middle cerebral artery right that is non dominant parietal lobe lesion okay so the individual will be able to copy only on the right side of the image he cannot copy the left side of the image and this particular neglect is not a serious problem right this is not a serious problem okay right but whereas you take the other options presence of the fever presence of the fever it will further precipitate the underlying manifestations so you need to treat the fever and spasticity has to be treated with the skeletal muscle relaxant and that skeletal muscle relaxant that you should give is the baclofen so baclofen should be given for the spasticity and dysphagia yes you have to treat dysphagia right you have to treat dysphagia why because if dysphagia is not treated the individual can develop aspiration so dysphagia has to be treated so the one which does not require an immediate treatment is neglect that is not a major concern among the options which has been given to you okay so that was about your some part of the uh, cerebrovascular accidents and one important part of the discussion is the aphasia okay so you see this question which of the following is not a feature of right middle cerebral artery territory infarct which of the following is not a feature of the right middle cerebral artery territory infarct right so that is your aphasia why because the right middle cerebral artery it is supplying the right cerebral hemisphere and we don't have the speech areas on the right side we have the speech areas on the left side so that is the reason why right middle cerebral artery territory in fact will not cause the development of aphasia now you have the various types of aphasias like the broca's aphasia so broca's aphasia which area is affected the broca's area is affected yes any one of you yes p uh, i'll be doing the ini ct recall session as well tomorrow on the same channel uh, or on my youtube channel you will be having that ini ct recall session as well right so your broca's aphasia it is not a fluent aphasia it is the non fluent aphasia right it is a non fluent aphasia so you take this broca's area and wernicke's area where is this broca's area present the broca's area it is present in the inferior frontal lobe okay and where will be the wernicke's area wernicke's area it is present in the superior temporal lobe and if you take the broadman areas the wernicke's area the broadman area is area number 22 whereas broca's area it is area number 44 and as well as the 45 right 44 and as well as 45 and whenever you take these aphasias see in case of right in case of the wernicke's aphasia it is the sensory aphasia right and these patients they will have normal fluency because the broca's is normal 
But what is the problem in case of Wernicke's? The individual will have nonsensical speech or neologisms are present in case of Wernicke's aphasia. Whereas Broca's aphasia, and it is effluent aphasia. Your Wernicke's aphasia, it is effluent aphasia. Right? Then coming to the Broca's aphasia. Broca's aphasia, it is a non-fluent aphasia. And it is a motor aphasia. Right? And in these individuals, there are no neologisms. Right? There are no neologisms. Okay? Right? And what about repetition? Repetition will be impaired in all the types of aphasia. Now, you see another question. Aphasia which affects the arcuate fibers is called. Aphasia that affects the arcuate fibers is called. Right, that will be the conduction aphasia, where there is arcuate fibers which are being affected. Okay, next question. Now, fluent aphasia with preserved comprehension and impaired repetition is, impaired repetition is, yes, anyone? Fluent aphasia with preserved comprehension and impaired repetition is, right. So. That will be your conduction aphasia. Hmm? That will be your conduction aphasia. So, fluent aphasia. What does that mean? Your Broca's is normal. Preserved comprehension. What does that mean? Your Wernicke's area is also normal. But there is impaired repetition. So, your arcade fibers are gone. Right? Arcade fibers are gone. And please remember, in all the types of aphasia, there will be impaired repetition. Broca's, Wernicke's, conduction. In all of them, you will have impaired repetition. Right? So, the answer in this question is the conduction aphasia. Right? So, that is about your topic of the aphasia. Yes. Yeah, madam is also answering the medicine questions. Right. So, now we will move on to the next question. That is the brown sequoid syndrome. So, brown sequoid syndrome, what exactly is this? It is the hemisection of the spinal cord. Now, you see this question. The following are the components of brown sequoid syndrome except ipsilateral extensor plantar response, ipsilateral pyramidal tract involvement, contralateral spinothalamic tract involvement, contralateral posterior column involvement. So, what do you think is the correct answer? What do you think is the correct answer? Very good. So, <laughs> yes, P madam has answered wrongly, right? Okay. <laughs> right. So, the answer is the contralateral posterior column involvement will not be there. So, please remember, brown sequoid syndrome is what? It is the hemisection of spinal cord. And in case of the brown sequoid syndrome, what will be the motor manifestations? Motor manifestations will be at the site of lesion, right? At the site of lesion, you will have element paralysis and below the site of lesion, you will have UMN paralysis. And what will be the sensory manifestation in case of brown sequoid syndrome? The sensory manifestations in case of the brown sequoid syndrome is that you will have ipsilateral posterior column involvement and contralateral spinothalamic tract involvement, right? Contralateral spinothalamic tract involvement, okay? That is what is the discussion in the brown sequoid syndrome. So, you will not have contralateral posterior column involvement. It is the ipsilateral posterior column involvement, okay? And same question, yes, please answer this. Type of sensation lost on the same side in brown sequoid syndrome. Pain, touch, proprioception, temperature. Now you should answer this question. Type of sensation lost on same side in brown sequoid syndrome. Yes. Right. So that will be proprioception. Because proprioception is what? It is a posterior column sensation. And posterior column sensation, what did I tell you? They are being affected on the same side. Whereas the remaining... 
three options A, B, D, they are your phenothalamic tract sensations. They will not be lost ipsilateral, they will be lost contralateral. Okay. And one more question on the same, that is, a ventrolateral chordotomy is performed to produce the relief of pain from the right leg. It is effective because it interrupts the, it is effective because it interrupts the, yes, it interrupts the. So, where do you want to have pain relief on the right leg? So, if you want to have a pain relief on the right leg, which side spinothalamic tract should have been lost? Very good. So, what did I tell you? In case of the brown sequet syndrome, contralateral spinothalamic tract should be gone. So, the, you want the pain relief from the right leg. And in the right leg, so where will be your the right leg pain sensation uh, fibers coming from? They are from the contralateral side. So, left lateral spinothalamic tract should have been gone. Okay. The next important topic for the discussion will be the disorders of the cranial nerves. Right? Disorders of the cranial nerves. So, you see this question. Yes, any one of you? A patient presented with recurrent episodes of sharp pain over his right cheek that is precipitated on chewing. Between attacks, the patient is otherwise normal. What do you think is the most probable diagnosis? So, what do you think is the most probable diagnosis here? Right. So, that will be your trigeminal neuralgia. So, what will be the clinical features in patients with trigeminal neuralgia? The individual will have intensely sharp stabbing pain and that will be in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. And which particular distribution it is more common? Right, which particular distribution it is more common? It is more common in the distribution of your phi 2 rather than phi 3. That is your, your ophthalmic, maxillary, mandibular. So, maxillary division, the pain is more severe than compared to mandibular or ophthalmic division. And these individuals, they also have facial muscle spasms. And that is the reason why it is called tic dolorox. And most of the time, the pain will be unilateral. And which side it is more common? It is more common on the right side rather than the left side. And at the same time, you should know that these individuals will also have the autonomic symptoms. And what will be that autonomic symptoms? These autonomic symptoms will be the lacrimation and you will have a red eye. Right? And these autonomic symptoms will be in the distribution of 5-1. Right, they are present in the distribution of 5-1. And what is the drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia? Any one of you? What is the drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia? Right. So, drug of choice will be carbamazepine. And if the patient does not respond, we give oxcarbamazepine. Right. If the patient does not respond, we give oxcarbamazepine. And the other drugs that can be given is even your baclofen and as well as gabapentin can be given. Okay. Right. Then coming to, yes. Next is the facial nerve palsy. So, which among the cause is the facial nerve, which is the cause of the facial nerve palsy? Which is the cause of the facial nerve palsy? Right. In fact, in fact, the question, any one of you? The answer is all of the above. The answer is all of the above. Very good, Yogesh Sharma. So, all of these can cause the facial nerve palsy. Okay. And particularly, you take Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Can anyone tell me which particular ganglion is affected in Ramsey Hunt syndrome? Which ganglion is affected in Ramsey Hunt syndrome? It is the geniculate ganglion. Right? It is. The geniculate ganglia, which is affected in case of the Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Okay. It is the herpes zoster infection. Right. It is the herpes zoster infection of the geniculate ganglion. That is what is called Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Okay. Right. Then the next important is yes, you take the upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron paralysis of the seventh nerve. Can anyone answer this question? 
true regarding upper motor neuron seventh nerve paralysis is true regarding upper motor neuron seventh nerve paralysis is so please remember in case of upper motor neuron paralysis what is the mnemonic that you have to remember in upper motor neuron paralysis upper half of the face will be spared and what is affected in case of upper motor neuron paralysis then it is the contralateral sorry contralateral lower half paralysis will be there so remember in upper motor neuron paralysis the mnemonic that you have to remember is upper half of the face that is being spared right what is affected in uh, seventh nerve palsy uh, umn lesion it is only the lower half of the face that is being affected okay i will show you an image tell me whether the individual is having upper motor neuron paralysis or lower motor neuron paralysis what is this patient having is it umn paralysis or lmn paralysis yes quickly right so if you observe very carefully here right if you observed very carefully the frowning or the fold over the eye uh, the forehead lost the individual is unable to close the eye right yes it is lower motor neuron paralysis and your angle is lost and the individual is also unable to deviate the mouth on the affected side so this patient is having right this patient is having right lower motor neuron paralysis okay right lower motor neuron paralysis okay so remember in lower motor neuron paralysis it is ipsilateral half of the face that will be paralyzed right ipsilateral half of the face will be paralyzed whereas in upper motor neuron it is contralateral lower half of the face that will be paralyzed okay right then one more important condition is yeah answer this lmn facial paralysis lmn facial paralysis which is the true statement what is the true statement regarding the lmn facial paralysis any one of you right so in patients with lmn paralysis the individual cannot close the eye so cornea should be protected right cornea should be protected then what about the other options you take the melkerson rosenthal syndrome see melkerson rosenthal syndrome it is not bilateral paralysis it is unilateral paralysis and this melkerson rosenthal syndrome it is characterized by a triad what is that unilateral paralysis of the facial nerve there will be swollen lips of the individual and there will be also fissured tongue right there will be fissured tongue so that is what is your melkerson rosenthal syndrome okay it is not bilateral it is unilateral then what about this mobius syndrome see mobius syndrome it is not unilateral it is bilateral so mobius syndrome is what it is caused by absence or under development of the 6th and 7th nerve right under development of the 6th and 7th nerve that is what is your mobius syndrome it is bilateral whereas melkerson rosenthal unilateral okay then prognosis affected uh, before repeat electrical stimulation is a wrong statement right the prognosis is not being affected in patients with your bell's palsy that is lmn palsy they have the good prognosis right they have the good prognosis okay so that was about your cranial nerve involvement and the next important quick discussion is on the topic of the headache so very simple question first most common cause of headache what do you think is the most common cause of headache right so the most common cause of headache will be the tension headache right that will be tension headache so how do we classify this headache 
वन इज योर प्राइमरी हेड एक द अदर वन इज द सेकेंडरी हेड एक तो मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज ऑफ प्राइमरी हेड एक दैट इज टेंशन हेड एक सेकेंड मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज माइग्रेन वेर एज द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज ऑफ सेकेंडरी हेड एक विल बी द सिस्टमिक इन्फेक्शन right that will be systemic infections now you need to know the description of the migraine the description of the migraine is very very important so you have to remember this mnemonic that is pound what does this pound stands for p stands for pulsating in nature so the headache in case of migraine will be pulsating headache and on an average it is one day duration right so the total duration is almost around 4 to 72 hours but on average it will be one day duration and it is mostly unilateral and these individuals they have nausea or vomiting and it is disabling in character right disabling in character so out of these five at least four should be there right out of these five at least four should be there okay that is what is the description of the migraine and when do we use the word status migraineosis when do we use the word status migraineosis when the migraine is present for more than 72 hours then we use the word status migraineosis okay right and this particular migraine is as everyone is aware of it is associated with aura and as well as without aura and if it is present with aura, it is called classical migraine. And if it is without aura, it is common migraine. And among the aura, which form of aura is more common? It is the visual aura, which is more common that you have to remember. And you have various forms of migraine. The other forms of migraine are what? The other forms of migraine are retinal migraine. So in case of retinal migraine, there can be thrombosis of retinal artery causing blindness within the individual. So there can be transient monoocular blindness due to thrombosis of retinal artery then we have basilar migraine basilar migraine is that where there is prominent brain stem symptoms right and which vessels are affected for the development of basilar migraine it is basilar posterior cerebral arteries and lastly hemiplegic migraine hemiplegic migraine along with headache the individual will also have the unilateral paralysis and finally the treatment see what is the drug of choice for acute attack of migraine? If it is mild to moderate, we give NSAIDs. But if it is severe form of acute attack of migraine, then we give sumatriptan. Sumatriptan is the drug of choice. But what is the question for you here? What is the drug of choice for status migraineosis? Anyone of you? Drug of choice for status migraineosis. Anyone? So, drug of choice for status migraineosis will be prochlorperazine. Right? Drug of choice will be what? Prochlorperazine. That is a drug of choice for status migraine. Okay? Right. Then you should know what are all the various drugs we give for prophylaxis. That is another important question that will be asked. So, we give some antihypertensives like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and occasionally ACE inhibitors. But that will not be priority. And antidepressants like tricyclic antidepressants and selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And we also give some anticonvulsants for prophylaxis that is valproic acid, topiramate and gabapentin. So these are the drugs that we give for prophylaxis. So this finishes your migraine. Next. So a 45 year old man, daily headache, two attacks per day for past three weeks. Each attack is there for almost an hour and it awakens the patient from sleep. The patient has noticed associated tearing and reddening of the right eye and there is also nasal stuffiness. The pain is very deep, excruciating and limited on the right side of the head. So the neurological examination is non-focal, most likely diagnosis in this case. Most likely diagnosis in this case. So what do you think is the answer? Very good. So that will be the cluster headache. So what is this cluster headache? Please remember, cluster headache is the one which is more commonly seen in males and it is a unilateral headache and the headache is mainly in the periorbital localization. The pain is mainly located in the periorbital area and it is very intense headache, right? And why is it called cluster? Because the episodes, they appear in clusters and again, there will be 
a headache free period and again they will have the clusters of episodes that is the reason why it is called cluster headache and each attack it will last for nearly less than 3 hours and you should know what is the drug of choice okay what will be the first line treatment yes what will be the first line treatment what will be the first line treatment the first line treatment will be high flow oxygen so you should give almost 12 liters per minute that will be the first line treatment okay and if at all if you want to give the drug you need to give sumatriptan and the other drug that can be given is gabapentin or pregabalin can be given and the drugs that can be given for prophylaxis right that will be your verapamil okay so now this migraine it is a unilateral headache Cluster headache, it is also unilateral headache. And let me just discuss one bilateral headache. A woman has bilateral headache that worsens with emotional stress. She has two children, both are doing badly in the school. What do you think is the diagnosis in this case? What do you think is the diagnosis in this case? Right. So, that will be your tension headache. Okay, so tension headache, it is usually bilateral and it is a dull aching headache. It's a dull aching headache. So this will subside by taking rest or you can give the simple paracetamol for reducing that headache. So this is about the discussion of the topic related to the headache. Next, next important topic will be the Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism, we have two forms, primary Parkinsonism and secondary Parkinsonism. So primary Parkinsonism is mainly due to gene mutation. Can anyone tell me what is the gene that is being mutated in primary Parkinsonism? Yes. What is the gene that is being mutated in patients with primary Parkinsonism? The gene that is being mutated in primary Parkinsonism is Park gene. Right. And it is present on chromosome 1. Right. It is present on chromosome 1 okay then you have secondary parkinsonism secondary parkinsonism is what it is secondary to encephalitis post encephalitis or even it can be secondary to toxins which particular toxin that is your mptp what is mptp methylphenyl tetrahydropyridine and even manganese can cause parkinsonism okay and even carbon monoxide can cause parkinsonism there are certain drugs that is called drug induced parkinsonism Drugs that will cause Parkinsonism are mainly Reserpine, Phenothysines, Butyrophenones and Metaclopramide. And we have Ischemic Parkinsonism that is called Vascular Parkinsonism and this can occur due to decreased blood supply to the basal ganglia. And even tumours of the basal ganglia can cause Parkinsonism. Punch drunk syndrome which we, which we have seen in our boxer Mohamed Ali, right? So this is seen in case of the boxers. And even certain infections can cause Parkinsonism, mainly like HIV and as well as the influenza. They are the one which can cause Parkinsonism. And you should know what is the earliest feature of Parkinsonism. Any one of you? What is the earliest feature in Parkinsonism? The earliest feature in Parkinsonism will be, yes, very good. That will be tremors. Okay. Resting tremors. It is not hypokinesia. It is the resting tremors that will be the earliest manifestation in case of Parkinsonism. And you should know this triad in Parkinsonism. What is this RAT? RAT stands for rigidity. A stands for akinesia. T stands for tremors. And that to what type of tremors that you will have? That is resting tremors that you will have. Okay. And so this table is very, very important. So bradykinesia, resting tremors, rigidity. And the gait, the characteristic gait, what is that gait? With stupid posture, that is the festinate gait these individuals with Parkinsonism will have. And they will have postural instability. And because of postural instability, at one point of time, they are completely wheelchair bound. So once they are completely wheelchair bound, that is considered as a red flag sign in Parkinsonism. That means it is a severe form of Parkinsonism. And in patients with Parkinsonism, they will not only have motor manifestations, they also have non-motor manifestations. And that non-motor manifestations will be in the form of anosmia, where there is loss of sensation of smell and mild sensory loss 
pain there can be mood disorder in the form of depression and what are the other motor manifestations they will have very small handwriting micrographia expressionless face that is masked faces reduced eye blink which is nothing but your myerson sign and you have soft voice that is hypophonia and they will have difficulty in swallowing and they also have this freezing so these are the clinical features in parkinsonism then coming to the treatment so what is the first line drug in patients with parkinsonism what is the first line drug in patients with parkinsonism so the first line drugs in patients with parkinsonism please remember it is your levodopa hmm? that will be your levodopa okay right so and but remember when you are giving this levodopa it is associated with involuntary movement by itself so that is the reason why in young individuals in young individuals actually levodopa is a first line treatment no doubt in that but in young individuals with parkinsonism usually it is a disorder of elderly individuals but in young individuals if there is development of parkinsonism what we give is dopamine agonist right what we give is dopamine agonist if it is in young individuals these are the lines directly from harrison actually first line drug levodopa but in young individuals this levodopa is associated with levodopa induced dyskinesia that is the reason why in young individuals we start with the dopamine agonist okay so that was about your parkinsonism so if you see the summary of the basal ganglia disorder so basal ganglia what are the structures we have caudate nucleus putamen substantia nigra subthalamic nucleus right and these are the structures and even globus pallidus right so if globus pallidus is gone then what is the involuntary movement that is athetosis which is nothing but a continuous writhing movement of the hand arm neck and face if there is subthalamic nucleus gone this is the recent inact question subthalamic nucleus gone then the individual will develop any ballistics and caudate nucleus and putamen gone there will be development of chorea substantia nigra gone then there will be development of parkinson okay so this table is very very important so which particular structure of basal ganglia gone and what is the involuntary movement that will be developed okay right so that was about your the discussion related to parkinsonism and basal ganglia disorder and the next important discussion is on the topic of the meningitis okay so please answer this question bacterial meningitis it is acute purulent infection within the subarachnoid space subdural space extradural space all of the above all of the above bacterial meningitis remember it is acute purulent infection within the subarachnoid space it is not all of the above it is only in the subarachnoid space okay and you should know what is the most common organism that is responsible for the bacterial meningitis most common organism responsible for uh, your bacterial meningitis among the options which are given to you which is the most common organism right that will be streptococcus pneumonia but whereas you take in neonates in neonates in india like what is the most common organism that will be klebsiella right and followed by that escherichia coli right followed by that escherichia coli okay right now you should know which organism will cause post meningitis deafness which organism causes post meningitis deafness any one of you right so the organism that will cause post meningitis deafness will be yes that will be haemophilus influenza that is what is the organism that will cause post meningitis deafness and what will be the important clinical features in case of meningitis it is high grade fever headache will be there and neck rigidity will be there and there will be also projectile vomiting and there will be photophobia so these will be the features in case of meningitis and you have to know the two important signs what are those two important signs one is your kernic sign right so what is that kernic sign that you should make the individual to lie in supine position and you from the passive flexion of the hip 
and from passive flexion of the knee right you need to extend the knee the knee cannot be fully extended that is called kernik sign and the next one is the brugiski's neck sign you try to flex the neck automatically there will be flexion of the knee that is called the brugiski's neck sign now in case of patients with meningitis yes what is the correct sequence to be followed in suspected bacterial meningitis what is the correct sequence to be followed in suspected bacterial meningitis go through all the options and please answer this so first and foremost what you have to do in a case of meningitis is you have to draw the blood culture sample then you should give an empirical antibiotic then you have to do neuroimaging to rule out the any intracranial space occupying lesion followed by that you need to do lumbar puncture so the answer is a the answer is a okay so it is lumbar uh, sorry blood culture empirical antibiotic neuroimaging and then the lumbar puncture should be done see after giving antibiotic if you take the sample it will be of no use the organism will die by the time you uh, take the culture and you are giving the antibiotic first no first blood culture then antibiotic should be done given then neuroimaging then lumbar puncture should be done and whenever you are doing lumbar puncture right whenever you are doing lumbar puncture what is the site for lumbar puncture l1 l2 l2 l3 l3 l4 l4 l5 what is the best site for lumbar puncture right so the best site for lumbar puncture please remember very good so in between l3 and l4 you have to do lumbar puncture and what is the name of the needle for lumbar puncture we have quinkies needle and the other one is the sprots needle these are the two important needles for the lumbar puncture and you should know the worker right you should know the csf this table is very very important which i am about to discuss so i'll tell you normal and csf picture in bacterial tubercular viral and fungal meningitis and even glen barry syndrome comparison okay so you take the normal csf pressure that will be 50 to 180 millimeters of water and normal csf will be clear like water okay and the number of cells will be 0 to 4 cells per cubic millimeter and it is predominantly lymphocytes and sugars will be two thirds of the plasma sugars and proteins will be 15 to 45 milligrams per cent and in case of bacterial meningitis what will happen to this the csf pressure is elevated the csf will appear turbid and what will happen to the cells they are elevated so more than 1000 cells per cubic millimeter will be there and it is mainly neutrophilic predominant and sugars will be utilized by the bacteria for the growth so sugars will be reduced and our body will produce antibodies against the bacteria which are nothing but the proteins so the proteins are elevated and similar picture you will have in tubercular meningitis but only difference is that the lymphocytic predominant will be there in tubercular meningitis and the glucose will be decreased and proteins will be elevated whereas in viral meningitis the csf pressure will be elevated but the csf will be clear like water and it is your lymphocytic predominant the glucose levels will appear normal and the proteins are elevated in viral meningitis and in glen barry syndrome everything will be normal right but only albuminocytological dissociation will be there and what is the differential diagnosis for albuminocytological dissociation differential diagnosis for albuminocytological dissociation any one of you so differential diagnosis for albuminocytological dissociation will be the Froin syndrome right that will be Froin syndrome so please remember it's a very important next coming to fungal meningitis the csf pressure will be elevated the csf will be clear and how will be the cells the lymphocytic predominant will be there sugars will be utilized by the fungus fungal growth and your csf proteins will be normal or elevated when you are taking csf in early stages the proteins will be normal but later the proteins are elevated okay right so that is about the csf picture in all the forms of meningitis then please identify this test tube what is this what is the diagnosis 
So where do you come across this? So whatever has been given to you there, it is a cobweb coagulum, right? So cobweb coagulum, what does it contain? It contains proteins. And where do you see this? You will see that in case of tubercular meningitis. Right? So, cobweb coagulum, which contains proteins, it is seen in case of the tubercular meningitis. Okay? Right. And you take the organ, uh, your tubercular meningitis, what is the treatment that you will give? In case of tubercular meningitis, we give 2 grams of ceftriaxone. It is not 1 gram of ceftriaxone, 2 grams of ceftriaxone plus vancomycin should be given. And in case of tubercular meningitis, we give anti-tubercular therapy that is nearly around 6 to 9 months. And in case of viral meningitis, right? Uh, the drug that we need to give is the acyclovir and in fungal meningitis the most common fungal infection that will cause is your the cryptococcal meningitis and what will be what will you give for fungal meningitis liposomal amphotericin b should be given in case of fungal meningitis okay so that is about your meningitis now the next important neurological disorder will be the motor neuron disease so the quick question is which is pathognomic for motor neuron disease? Yes, what is pathognomic for motor neuron disease? Any one of you? Right, so motor neuron disease, please remember it is only the motor neurons that are being affected. Right, so among the options which has been given to you, sensory loss, never. Bladder and bubble involvement, never. Pseudohypertrophy, never. And pathognomic will be your uh, fasciculations. Okay. And the age group at which you see this motor neuron disease is mainly around 30 to 60 years. And do you know what is the important risk factor for motor neuron disease? Important risk factor for the development of motor neuron disease. Any one of you? The important risk factor is smoking, right? Smoking, okay? And we have three important forms of motor neuron disease. What are those three important forms? You have some motor neuron disease where there is involvement of both upper and lower motor neuron. And that will be your amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And there is a motor neuron disease where there is predominantly upper motor neuron involvement. And what is that? That is your primary lateral sclerosis. And there is predominantly lower motor neuron involvement. And what is that? That will be your spinomuscular atrophy. So, spinomuscular atrophy, it is predominantly lower motor neuron involvement. But among all these, which is more common? The more common will be amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And finally, and how will be the prognosis in these individuals? They have like bad prognosis. And finally, how do they die? These patients with motor neuron disease, they die because of the respiratory failure. So, what is the most common cause of death in patients with motor neuron disease? That will be the respiratory failure. Okay. Next. Then, is there any drug for motor neuron disease? Yes. We have two important drugs. One, we have Riluzol. What this Riluzol will do? Actually, this motor neuron disease is mainly because of excessive release of glutamate. What this Riluzol will do? Riluzol will inhibit the glutamate release. Right? Will inhibit the glutamate release. So, the advantage of this particular Riluzol is it will slow the progression of the disease. And one more drug we have for motor neuron disease that is Idavarone. That is Idavarone. What is Idavarone? It's a free radical scavenger. And even this will slow the disease progression. So that is about your motor neuron disease and you should not wind up neurology without discussing multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is another very very important topic in the neurology. Without revising this topic, you should not go to the exam. Now, in multiple sclerosis, what is that particular drug that will cause maximum reduction in the appearance of the new lesions and change in the disease CBRT? in RRMS type of multiple sclerosis. Any one of you? So, which particular drug will cause maximum reduction in appearance of the new lesions? Okay. 
so maximum reduction appearance of the new lesions that is achieved by your natalizumab hmm? that is achieved by natalizumab and one quick question please tell me multiple sclerosis it is a demyelinating disorder of peripheral nervous system demyelinating disorder of central nervous system demyelinating disorder of peripheral nervous system and central nervous system what do you think is the correct answer a b c yes please remember your multiple sclerosis it is a demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system hmm? it's a demyelinating disorder of central nervous system and for the development of multiple sclerosis you have a hla association and what is the hla association for the development of multiple sclerosis that is hla dr2 gene right hla dr2 gene that is being demonstrated to be genetically susceptible individuals okay and the other causes include environmental multiple sclerosis environmental multiple sclerosis is what that is seen in patients with vitamin d deficiency and you also have some viruses which can cause multiple sclerosis that is epstein barr virus even this also can cause multiple sclerosis and we have the four important patterns in multiple sclerosis rrms ppms prms and spms so which is the most common type of multiple sclerosis any one of you what is the most common type of multiple sclerosis so the most common type of multiple sclerosis is rrms that is relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis and you know which is the rare that is ppms right rare and the one with worst prognosis okay rare and the one with worst prognosis that will be your ppms okay right and in case of multiple sclerosis what will be the clinical symptomatology the most common symptomatology will be the sensory loss and that sensory loss will be in the form of paresthesias and what is the most common cranial nerve which is affected that will be optic neuritis or optic nerve will be there and because of which the individual can have the visual loss there can be blindness there can be color blindness so multiple visual manifestations are there and the other features will be weakness paresthesias diplopia ataxia ataxia is due to what that is mainly due to demyelination of cerebellum okay vertigo paroxysmal attacks and there can be even bladder involvement and you have to know one important phenomenon right important phenomenon yes asadullah tell me this question tell me the answer to this question uthoff's phenomenon seen in multiple sclerosis is due to uthoff's phenomenon what is that whenever the individual is exposed to the hot water or whenever the individual is exposed to the hot environment the symptoms of multiple sclerosis they get exaggerated and why is that due to very good that is due to decreased conduction of nerves it is not due to increased conduction it is due to decreased conduction of nerve okay and the next important sign is lermit sign what is lermit sign lermit sign is that on bending the neck or on flexing the neck there will be electric shock like sensation down the spinal cord that is called the hermit sign and where is that we bend our neck in front of a barber that is the reason why it is called barber chair sign see in front of the barber you have to definitely bend your neck right in front of the barber you cannot say hum jukega nahi right so that does not work out in front of a barber okay you have to definitely bend your neck in front of a barber to have a proper haircut okay so that is the reason why it is called the barber chair sign and what are the conditions where you can have this uh, lermit sign that is in case of multiple sclerosis next in case of the subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord that is vitamin b12 deficiency and you can also have that in case of the cervical spondylosis right and you also see that in patients with syringomyelia right syringomyelia is that where you have a dissociative sensory loss so even in syringomyelia you can have this Uh, lermit sign okay right so next 
Now, what is the investigation of choice in multiple sclerosis? The investigation of choice will be gadolinium enhanced MRI. Right? Investigation of choice is <laughs> yes, Ankit Pandey. So there your barber does like that one. <laughs> okay, right. So investigation of choice is gadolinium enhanced MRI. Okay, so what is that you will see in the gadolinium enhanced MRI? You will have this fibrotic blocks in the periventricular area and the description is called as the Dawson sphere. Okay, that is the investigation of choice. And what does the CSF analysis show? CSF analysis in patients with multiple sclerosis that will show you the presence of the oligoclonal bands. And what is the name of the criteria in case of multiple sclerosis? That will be McDonald's criteria. Right, the name of the criteria is McDonald's criteria. And we have one rare form of multiple sclerosis. Can anyone tell me what is this? Devick's disease, which is also called neuromyelitis optica. So what is the criteria? What is the criteria to call it as the Devick's disease? So, there should be demyelination of more than or equal to three vertebral segments. And along with that, there will be optic neuritis. That is what is called neuromyelitis optica or Devick's disease. Right? Now, one quick question here now. So, we have a 30-year-old female presents with complaining of gradual onset weakness of legs of one month with reduction in visual acuity and urinary incontinence for past few days. Contrast MRI shows the periventricular lesion. Which of the following drugs is not used in these patients? Which of the following drug is not used in these patients? Pingoli mode, beta interferon, glatiramer acetate, mitotain. Yes, which is that you will not use? Right, we don't use mitotain. Right, where do we use this mitotain? We use this mitotain in the treatment of Cushing's, but not in case of. See, what is the discussion about? The discussion is about multiple sclerosis. We give pingoli mode, we give beta interferon, we also give glatiramer acetate, but not your the mitotain. Okay, and what is the drug of choice for acute attack of multiple sclerosis? In case of acute attacks, we give methylprednisolone. Methylprednisolone is a drug of choice for acute attacks of multiple sclerosis. Whereas, what are the disease modifying therapy? Disease modifying therapy will be your interferon, right? That is interferon beta, okay, beta interferons. Then glatiramer acetate, natalizumab, fingolimod, metoxantron, dimethyl fumarate, teriflunomide, and alemtuzumab. But among all these, the one which is very much effective in case of RRMS. That will be your natalism. Okay. So that was about your multiple sclerosis. Right. Then the next important topic is about the epilepsy. So in epilepsy, what is very important here is the drug of choice in various types of epilepsy. Yes, please answer this. What is the drug of choice in case of GTCS or atonic or myoclonic or absent seizures? Anyone? <clears throat> drug of choice in GTCS, atonic, myoclonic, or absent seizures. That will be valproic acid. And what is the drug of choice during an episode of febrile seizures? During an episode of febrile seizures, what we give is intranasal, right, intranasal midazolam or the other drug that can be given is rectal dizepam, rectal dizepam. But what is prophylaxis that you should give? Prophylaxis of uh, febrile seizure we give same midazolam, but that will be oral midazolam. And if it is absent seizures less than 4 years, what is the drug of choice? That will be ethosuximide. Right? That will be ethosuximide. And in case of infantile spasm, what is the drug of choice? Infantile spasm, the drug of choice will be adrenocorticotrophic hormone. And infantile spasm in tuberous sclerosis, the drug of choice will be vigabatrin. Whereas, in status epilepticus, the drug of choice will be lorazepam. Right? Drug of choice will be lorazepam. And in refractory status epilepticus, the drug of choice will be midazolam. Right? Midazolam. 
So this is about the drug of choice in various types of epilepsy. Okay. Then you should know what is the treatment for medically refractory epilepsy. So what is the type of diet that you prescribe in case of medically refractory epilepsy? What is the type of diet that you prescribe in case of medically refractory epilepsy? That is your ketotic diet or it is the ketogenic diet. And what is the procedure that you will do? The procedure that we do is vagal nerve stimulation. Vagal nerve stimulation or the deep brain stimulation. So these are the treatment options that you have for the refractory epilepsy and the best results are seen even with surgery. For temporal lobe epilepsy, we do temporal lobectomy. We do temporal lobectomy. Okay. Right. And yeah. So for with which particular drug you have this teratogenicity? With which drug you have this teratogenicity? Yes. This is one of the important image based question. Very good. These are that is what uh, the individual has developed the cleft lip and as well as the cleft palate. So that you will see with the phenytoin, which is nothing but your fetal hydantoin syndrome. And this will be the hypertrophic gums and hirsutism that can be seen with the adverse effects associated with the phenytoin. So this completes the discussion of the important topics in the neurology, right? Important topics in the neurology. Okay, so I hope I have covered maximum topics in the neurology. Now we'll move on to the next important topic that is pulmonology, right? Pulmonology. So the topic, first topic will be the ARDS, that is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, can anyone tell me, right, can anyone tell me normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with pulmonary edema? is seen in normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with pulmonary edema is seen in yeah sham the pdf i have uploaded on my instagram handle hmm? i have sent a link on my instagram handle that is rajesh gubba which is there in my bio of instagram and once you click on the link you will get the pdf there right very good. So, the one among the options which has been given to you, the one which will cause air. So, where will you have your normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? Normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, you have that in case of ARDS, that is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And among the options, which one will cause your ARDS, that is your high altitude. So, high altitude, it is associated with the development of pulmonary edema. And you should know. Overall, what is the most common cause for ARDS? Any one of you? Most common cause of ARDS overall is, anyone? Most common cause of ARDS overall will be sepsis. Okay. And most common cause of direct lung injury leading to ARDS. Here the answer will be pneumonia. Whereas, most common cause of indirect lung injury leading to ARDS, that will be sepsis, right? That will be sepsis, okay? So, please remember these are very, very important points. And the next thing is you should know the difference between non-cardiogenic and cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you have that in case of ARDS, where your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be absolutely normal. Whereas cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you will have that in left ventricular failure. And here, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be elevated. Right? And how much is the normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? That is around 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury. But the cutoff what we take is 18 millimeters of mercury. Right? And what is the name of the criteria? Anyone of you? What is the name of the criteria for ARDS? Anyone? Name of the criteria for ARDS. Name of the criteria for ARDS, it is called the Berlin's criteria. Hmm? It is called Berlin's criteria. So, how can you remember or how will you remember the uh, criteria in Berlin's? Please remember the mnemonic ARDS. What does this A stands for? A stands for 
acute in onset where the symptoms will develop within one week of clinical insult. R stands for reduced PaO2 by FiO2. Reduced PaO2 by FiO2. And D stands for diffuse bilateral opacities on the chest x-ray. S stands for Swangans catheter showing normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Okay, so with the help of Swangans catheter, you will measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Okay, so that will be showing normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And depending upon your PaO2 by FiO2, we assess the CVRT of ARDS. What is that? If it is like, if the PaO2 by FiO2 is like 200 to 300, that will be mild. If PaO2 by FiO2 is 100 to 200, that will be moderate. And if PaO2 by FiO2 is less than 100, that will be your severe ARDS. That will be your severe ARDS. And what will be the chest x-ray findings in patients with ARDS? This will be the chest x-ray. So, we, des we describe this as a complete white out lung. Right? We describe these lungs as the complete white out lung. Okay? And what are the quick important points and uh, related to ARDS? So, these are the nutshell points of ARDS. So, most common cause of ARDS is what? Sepsis. And how will be the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? Normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. What type of pulmonary edema? Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema will be there. And this pulmonary edema is rich in proteins. There will be formation of the hyaline membrane. And there is also intrapulmonary shunting. And how much will be your PaO2 by FiO2? That will be less than 200. Whereas in mild, it can be less than 300 also. Test X-ray, what it will show you? Bilateral white out lung. What is the treatment of choice? Low volume ventilation with continuous positive airway pressure. Low volume ventilation with continuous positive airway pressure. Okay, right. And this is the this, this is the chest x-ray that you will have in case of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema where you have bilateral white out opacities will be there. Can anyone tell me in which condition you will have this particular chest x-ray finding? In which condition you will have this particular chest x-ray finding. Hmm? You see that uh, opacity, how is it? So, it is like characteristic, right? It is like characteristic batwing appearance. Hmm? Characteristic batwing appearance. Very good. You will have this in case of congestive cardiac failure. Hmm? You will have this in case of Pulmonary edema caused by your congestive car. So, left ventricular failure, you have this characteristic batwing appearance. Okay, right. So, now after having discussed about the ARDS, the next important topic will be COPD. Right. Now, you, in the COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, what is the name of the criteria? The name of the criteria is the GOLD criteria. Right. That is Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease. That is what is called GOLD criteria. So, according to this GOLD criteria, when will you call very severe COPD? Any one of you? When will you call the word very severe COPD according to your gold criteria? Very good. So, your PaO2, by, sorry, your FEV1 per, uh, should be less than 30%. When your FEV1 is less than 30%, then we consider it as the very severe COPD, right? And when do we call like the mild, see, when your uh, FEV1 percentage, if it is more than 80%, then we call it as mild, okay. And if your FEV1 percentage, if it is like 50 to 79%, we call it as moderate. And if your FEV1 percentage, if it is like 30 to 49%, then we call it as severe. And if your FEV1 percentage is less than 30%, it is considered as the very severe. It is considered as very severe. Okay. This is very, very important. Now, in case of the COPD, uh, like what type of airways which are affected here? The airways which are affected in case of COPD is the smaller airways. And what is the definition of a smaller airway? The internal diameter should be less than 2 mm and there should be absence of the cartilage. Right? So, cartilaginous rings are absent. Right? There should be absence of the cartilage. And what are all the various examples of smaller airway disease? It is not only COPD. COPD, bronchial asthma, 
hypersensitivity pneumonitis, bronchiolitis, mineral dust pneumoconiosis. These are all smaller airway diseases. Okay, I'll repeat COPD, asthma, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, bronchiolitis and mineral dust pneumoconiosis. And very, very important question is about the read index. Tell me in which condition the read index is elevated. Yes, which condition the read index is elevated. So, first of all, what is read index? Read index is nothing but it is the ratio of thickness. It is the ratio of thickness of submucosal glands to that of the entire bronchial wall is called read index. And read index is increased in case of chronic bronchitis. And how much is the normal value? Normal value of your read index, it is 0.44 plus or minus 0.09. And how much is that in case of chronic bronchitis? That will be 0.52 plus or minus 0.08. So, read index is elevated in case of chronic bronchitis. Okay, and that is because of, because of that, the individual will have mucoid sputum. Then if you take related to emphysema, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with, yes, very, not centrius, not centrius, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with panacinar emphysema, hmm? it is associated with panacinar emphysema. Panasna means what? It is the entire acinus which is affected. That means your alveolar ducts, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar sac and even alveoli, everything is abnormally dilated. That is panasna. You will see that in case of the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And where will you get this centriasna uh, emphysema? Centriasna emphysema, you come across this in case of smokers. And centriasna emphysema, it is only respiratory bronchioles which are abnormally dilated. Whereas the distal part of the acinus, like alveolar duct, alveolar sac and alveoli will be normal in case of centriasna. Whereas paraseptal is what? It is the distal part of the acinus which is affected. That is your alveolar duct, alveolar sac and alveoli. That is being affected in case of paraseptal emphysema. Okay. And which part of the lung is affected in paraseptal emphysema? It is the peripheral part of the lung which is being affected and that is the reason why the individual can develop pneumothorax as well. Okay. Now, I will show you an x-ray. Please tell me, yeah, this x-ray is suggestive of what? Diagnosis of this x-ray is what? Any one of you quickly? This particular x-ray is suggestive of? So, this x-ray is suggestive of emphysema. So, what will be the picture in case of emphysema? You will have bilaterally hyperlucent lung fields will be there. And this vertical or tubular heart will be there. Actually, the heart will not become vertical or tubular. It is the abnormally irreversibly dilated lungs. They overlap the heart. Once they overlap the heart, the heart will be like vertical or tubular. And there will be low set diaphragm. So, the diaphragm, they comp the lungs, abnormally irreversibly dilated lungs, they compress the diaphragm. Okay, that is what is called the low set diaphragm. And next important is, this particular x-ray. What is this x-ray suggestive of? This is suggestive of chronic bronchitis. So, what is that you will have in chronic bronchitis? In case of chronic bronchitis, you have increased bronchovascular markings. Okay, Where the bronchovascular markings will be beyond one third. Right? Where the bronchovascular markings will be beyond one third. And as I already have said you, what is the name of the criteria in case of COPD? That is gold criteria. That is global initiative for obstructive lung disease. So, depending upon the CVRT, we give the treatment. When it, Just now we have discussed, when do we call mild COPD? When your FEV1 percentage is more than 80%. We give only short-acting beta agonist. When do we call moderate? When it is 50 to 79%. What do we add here? Long-acting beta agonist or anticholinergic drugs can be added. Whereas in severe COPD, where the FEV1 is 30 to 49%, we also add inhaled steroids. When FEV1 is less than 30%, we also give parental oxygen. So, that is about your COP. Okay. The next important topic is the bronchial asthma. And you should know in case of bronchial asthma, when do we use the word acute severe asthma? So, the question is, which of the following values is not 
a feature of acute severe asthma pulses paradoxes partial pressure of oxygen less than 8 kilopascals heart rate more than 110 peak expiratory flow rate 60 to 70 percentage of the expected value so when do which of the following is not the feature of yes abhai uh, which one you are talking about you have to follow the new guidelines definitely right so which one of the following is not the feature of the acute severe asthma yeah, for COPD treatment, you need to follow the new guidelines, the new one. Okay, right. So, which one of the following is not a feature of acute severe asthma? Yes, quickly. So, the feature which is not suggestive of acute severe asthma is peak expiratory flow rate 60 to 70 percent. So, how much will be the peak expiratory flow rate in case of acute severe asthma? In case of acute severe asthma, the peak expiratory flow rate will be less than 40 percent less than 40 percent whereas in case of very severe asthma right very severe asthma it will be less than 25 percent the peak expiratory flow rate will be less than 25 percent okay right and in case of patients with asthma what will be the clinical presentation it is mainly the V's V's will be the clinical presentation and apart from these, the individual will also have cough with expectoration. And the expectoration in patients with bronchial asthma, you have some important particles in the sputum. One is your Kirschman spirals. What is Kirschman spirals? They are like spiral shaped mucus plugs. That is what Kirschman spirals is. They have like creola bodies. What is creola bodies? They are nothing but ciliated columnar cells which are sloughed from the bronchial mucosa. Then you have charcoal laden crystals. What are charcoal laden crystals? These are slender and pointed at both ends. They are called charcoal laden crystals. And presence of charcoal laden crystals tells you that there is an inflammation, eosinophilic inflammation. Okay. So it is suggestive of eosinophilic inflammation. So what are the other conditions where you can have eosinophilic inflammation? You can have that in case of the parasitic infections as well. And that is even in parasitic infections, you can have this charcoal laden crystals. Okay, right. Then, whenever you are diagnosing asthma, so this particular asthma is diagnosed by asthma is diagnosed by FEV1, measurement of tidal volume, end expiratory flow rate, total lung capacity. So, asthma is also diagnosed, right, it is also diagnosed, it is diagnosed by your FEV1 percentage. So, just now as I was discussing the peak expiratory flow rate or like your FEV1, when will you call like mild asthma when your FEV1 percentage is like more than 70%. When will you call moderate asthma like FEV1 percentage is 40 to 69 percent and when FEV1 percentage is less than 40 percent it is considered as severe and when FEV1 percentage is less than 25 percent we call it as the very severe okay right now and this FEV1 is also very much important to differentiate COPD from bronchial asthma so if you have a doubt whether the patient is having COPD or bronchial asthma you need to do bronchodilator response test what is that you need to calculate the baseline FEV1 value, then you need to give short acting beta agonist that is salbutamol or albuterol. And after 5 to 10 minutes or 10 to 15 minutes, again you have to calculate the FEV1. So, if the increase in FEV1, right, if the increase in FEV1 is like more than 12 percent or in more than 200 ml after your salbutamol embolization, it is bronchial asthma. But if the increase is less than 12 percent or less than 200 ml, then it is considered to be the COPD, right? It is considered to be COPD, okay? And one quick question related to your bronchial asthma. Yes, answer this. A known asthmatic presented to the emergency with severe exacerbation not relieved by salbutamol. The patient was given corticosteroids and aminophilin. 
what is the rationale of giving corticosteroids along with salbutamol nebulization? What is the purpose of it? What is the purpose of it? So, you have to remember that the purpose of giving corticosteroids, right? The purpose of giving corticosteroids is that corticosteroids facilitate the action of the beta 2 agonist, right? They facilitate the action of the beta 2 agonist, okay? Right? They don't sensitize the adenosine receptor. They don't have the bronchodilator activity. And they don't increase the mucociliary clearance. Okay, they facilitate the action of your beta 2 agonist. Okay, right. That was about your bronchial asthma. The next important topic in pulmonology will be your cystic fibrosis. So, cystic fibrosis is what? It is an inherited disorder. Okay, what type of inheritance is your cystic, uh, cystic fibrosis? What type of inheritance is your cystic fibrosis? Any one of you? It is an autosomal recessive type of inheritance and it typically occurs in childhood and the inheritance is autosomal recessive type of inheritance and what is the gene which is being mutated and that has been asked in the recent INICT exam also right definitely they have given it as the CFTR gene but which chromosome it is chromosome 7 and on which location it is your delta right it is your delta F508 mutation and which amino acid it is phenylalanine deletion okay so this is the recently INICT question which particular gene on which chromosome which number which amino acid everything was asked so remember 508 phenylalanine deletion on chromosome 7 and what will be the presentation in patients with cystic fibrosis the neonates they present with meconium ileus and what will you give for meconium ileus you need to give gastrographin enema and why these individuals are prone for recurrent pneumonias? Because they have like thick and viscid mucus that is there in the lungs and that will be the source of infection. And other respiratory infection, uh, respiratory manifestation may be bronchiectasis. Now the question is, which part of the lung you have the bronchiectasis in case of cystic fibrosis? Any one of you please answer this. Upper lung fields, mid lung fields, lower lung fields. Which part of the lung field is affected in cystic fibrosis for the development of bronchiectasis? So please remember, it is the upper lung fields which are being affected. And GIT manifestations in patients with cystic fibrosis will be in the form of the secondary biliary cirrhosis. Why is that secondary biliary cirrhosis? Because there is thick and viscid bile juice that leads to the cholestatic jaundice. And that will manifest as the secondary biliary cirrhosis. And these individuals, they also have osmotic diarrhea. Why is that they have osmotic diarrhea? Because the pancreatic juice normally contain amylase, which is useful for sugar absorption. But here, the pancreatic juice, they be, it becomes thick. Once the pancreatic juice becomes thick, there is fall in the amylase levels. Once there is fall in the amylase levels, glucose absorption will not be there. And the glucose will absorb the fluid across the GAT, resulting in the osmotic diarrhea. And these individuals, they also develop infertility. So, what is the cause of infertility in males? The cause of infertility in males will be azospermia. But why is that azospermia? The reason for azospermia in males is because due to agenesis of the vas deferens. Due to agenesis of vas deferens. Whereas, even in females, there can be infertility. Why is that infertility in females? That is due to increase in the cervical mucus thickness. Once there is increase in cervical mucus thickness, the swimming of the sperms up to the fallopian tube cannot occur. And how do you investigate? So, you will investigate the first initial screening test will be sweat chloride concentration. So, what will be the, how much will be the sweat chloride concentration in case of cystic fibrosis? That will be more than 60 milli equivalents per liter. That should be minimum on two occasions. But what will be the investigation of choice? That is, you need to do genetic analysis. So, you have to check for the CFTR mutation analysis should be done. That will be the investigation of choice in these patients. Okay. And what will be the targeted therapy? 
the targeted therapy that you should give in case of cystic fibrosis is that you have to improve the CFTR gene. And what is the drug of choice there? Which is a potentiator of C your CFTR channel? The potentiator of CFTR channel will be Ivacaftor. Right? That will be Ivacaftor. And in severe stages of cystic fibrosis, what is left out? Lung transplantation is the only definitive treatment. Lung transplantation is the only definitive treatment. Okay, right. So that finishes your cystic fibrosis. Now, the next important topic in the pulmonology will be the bronchiectasis. Now, regarding the bronchiectasis, you should know which particular airways are affected in bronchiectasis? Medium sized airways, whereas COPD, small sized airways. And in bronchiectasis, the medium sized airways, which particular generation? 5th to 9th generation. And you should know which lobe is commonly affected in bronchiectasis. Anyone? Bronchiectasis is most common in which lobe? Any one of you? Very good. So that will be that will be the left lower lobe that is affected in case of bronchitis. That is the most common lobe. Why? Because the airway to the left lower lobe is long and narrow. That can get affected. And followed by the left lower lobe, the next most common lobe which is being affected is the middle lobe. And middle lobe, you have that only for the right lung. So, the middle lobe of the right lung is the next most commonly affected lobe. And if you take the types of bronchiectasis, so we have three important forms of bronchiectasis that is cylindrical, saccular or cystic, and then varicose. That is all depending upon the shape of the bronchi, which is abnormally irreversibly dilated. And which is the most common form? The most common form will be cylindrical bronchiectasis. And you should know which particular condition you will have mid lung field bronchiectasis what is the condition where you will have mid lung field bronchiectasis mid lung field bronchiectasis mid lung field bronchiectasis is seen in case of mycobacterium avium infection whereas the remaining all that is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis tuberculosis, post-radiation fibrosis and cystic fibrosis. In all these, it is the upper lobe bronchiectasis which is more common. And you also have lower lobe bronchiectasis. Lower lobe bronchiectasis is mainly seen in case of aspiration. Recurrent aspirations, there will be lower lobe bronchiectasis. Okay, that is about your upper, middle and lower lung bronchiectasis. Next, followed by that, you should know how do you diagnose these patients with that bronchiectasis. So, what will be the test x-ray finding in patients with bronchiectasis? You have that classical tram track appearance. So, in this irreversibly dilated bronchi, you have that classical tram track appearance, which is nothing but your railway track. Okay, next. But what is the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice will be your HRCT, high resolution CT scan. And in the high resolution CT scan, what will be the findings that you can have? You can have that tree in bud appearance or you can have this signet ring sign. You can have this signet ring sign and you can also do bronchoscopy. But what is the purpose of doing bronchoscopy? That is mainly for visualizing the bronchus. And one of the important complications in bronchiectasis is massive hemoptysis. So how will you treat this massive hemoptysis? How will you treat this massive hemoptysis in case of the bronchiectasis? Anyone? So, how will you treat this massive hemoptysis is you need to do bronchial artery embolization. Right? You need to do bronchial artery embolization. That is how you will treat the massive hemoptysis. Okay? So, that finishes your bronchiectasis. Then, the next important topic is the bronchogenic carcinoma. The next important topic is bronchogenic carcinoma. So, we have four important forms of bronchogenic carcinoma. That is small cell carcinoma, then large cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. But the important question is, the clubbing is least common in which type of bronchogenic carcinoma? Clubbing is least common in which type of bronchogenic carcinoma? 
clubbing is least common in case of small cell carcinoma of the lung. Please remember that is an important question. Right? It is least common in case of small cell carcinoma of the lung. Now, let me quickly discuss some important single liners related to bronchogenic carcinoma. So, the question that can be asked is, what is the most common benign tumor of the lung? The most common benign tumor of the lung, that will be hamartoma. Right. And what is the most common cause of recurrent hemoptysis? The most common cause of recurrent hemoptysis will be bronchial adenoma. And what is the most common cause of cancer death? That will be lung cancer. Among all the cancers, the one cancer which can cause death most commonly will be lung cancer. And what is the most common risk factor for bronchogenic carcinoma? That will be smoking. And what is the most common natural risk factor? for the development of bronchogenic carcinoma that will be exposure to the radon gas right exposure to radon gas it's an environmental pollutant and most common rib which is affected in pancos tumor where will you see this pancos tumor you see that in case of adenocarcinoma and the most common rib that is affected in case of pancos will be the first rib and what are the most common nerve roots which are involved in pan post, the most common nerve roots will be C8, T1 and as well as T2. Where, where do you come across this pan post? You will come across this in case of adenocarcinoma. Then, what is the most common histological type all over the world? The most common histological type all over the world will be adenocarcinoma. And what is the most common histological type in India? that will be squamous cell carcinoma, right? And what is the most common histological type that you will see in non-smokers? That will be adenocarcinoma. And what is the most common variety that you will see in young patients? That will be also adenocarcinoma, right? So, don't worry whether if you are not able to write, I will be sending you this PDF immediately after the class, okay? Yesterday's PDF, as already I have said you, I have sent that on my Instagram handle that is Rajesh Gubba. The link is available in my bio. Okay. Right. Now, what is the most common histological variety in females? The most common histological variety in females will be adenocarcinoma. And what is the most common site for metastasis from carcinoma lung? That is to the liver. What is the most common endocrine organ to be involved in carcinoma of the lung? that will be the adrenal gland, right? That will be the adrenal gland. And what is that particular carcinoma that will be metastasizing to the opposite lung? The carcinoma that will metastasize to the opposite lung will be adenocarcinoma. And most common tumor to metastasize to the heart, actually from the lung where it will go most commonly to the liver. Which endocrine organ? Adrenal gland. But for the heart, if the metastasis has to come from, it will most commonly come from the carcinoma of the lung. And what are the bronchogenic carcinomas that will cavitate? The bronchogenic carcinomas that will cavitate is squamous cell carcinoma and as well as the large cell carcinoma. And what are the histological varieties which are central in distribution? Central in distribution are squamous cell carcinoma and as well as the small cell carcinoma, right? SQ stands for squamous cell carcinoma. And which is the type of bronchogenic carcinoma which has peripheral distribution? That is adenocarcinoma. And which is the type of bronchogenic carcinoma which has paraneoplastic activity? That will be small cell carcinoma, okay? Your uh, small cell uh, carcinoma it can produce antidiuretic hormone. It can produce atrial natriuretic peptide. It can produce the your pushings, that is your corticosteroids. Okay, right. And you should know what is the bronchogenic carcinoma which will cause hypokalemia. That will be small cell carcinoma. Right, that will be small cell carcinoma. Why? Because it will produce pushings. And in pushings, there are more steroids. When there is more steroids that will go and activate the ENAC channels. 
and the type of bronchogenic carcinoma which will cause hypercalcemia that will be squamous cell carcinoma why because squamous cell carcinoma is a source for parathormone that can cause hypercalcemia and the type of bronchogenic carcinoma which is most responsive to chemotherapy will be small cell carcinoma we don't do surgery in uh, small cell carcinoma because it is high tendency of metastasis so surgery is ineffective in case of small cell carcinoma and the one which will uh, respond better to radiotherapy is also small cell carcinoma but among all these types of bronchogenic carcinoma the one which will has the best prognosis that will be squamous cell carcinoma hmm, that will be squamous cell carcinoma and you need to know the two important the tumor markers what are the two important tumor markers the two important tumor markers are carcino embryonic antigen and neuron specific enolase so carcino embryonic antigen what is it it is a metastatic right it tells you about the metastatic cancer hmm? it tells you about metastatic cancer and what is this neuron specific enolase neuron specific enolase it is a prognostic marker right it is a prognostic marker in case of the small cell carcinoma okay so that is about the tumor markers in case of bronchogenic carcinoma and this finishes bronchogenic carcinoma and the last important topic in the pulmonology will be your pulmonary embolism and what will be the clinical presentation in pulmonary embolism the most common presentation will be sudden onset dyspnea and other manifestations are syncopal attack hypotension cyanosis and second most common symptom will be pleuritic chest pain the others are cough hemoptysis and palpitation now how will you diagnose so you take the ecg in patients with pulmonary embolism what do you think is the most frequent ecg finding in pulmonary embolism any one of you most common ecg finding no 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 it is not s1 q3 t3 pattern s1 q3 t3 pattern it is present only in 7 to 10 percentage of patients with pulmonary embolism very good right that will be sinus tachycardia sinus yes rajesh natarajan i will just upload with annotations i will upload with annotations don't worry about that okay right sinus tachycardia yes rajesh natarajan this will be more than enough for your entire medicine because i am discussing each and every topic and important points in, in every topic this will be more than enough okay right so the most common ecg finding will be the sinus tachycardia and what are the other findings that you can have right axis deviation can be there p pulmonary can be there right bundle branch block can be there and s1 q3 t3 pattern is present only in 7 to 10 percentage of patient okay right then and this is what is your sinus tachycardia and if you calculate the heart rate in this it is around 150 so 300 divided by number of large boxes between the rr interval if you take there are nearly around two boxes so that will be around 150 or more than 150 and this is what is your s1 q3 t3 pattern s1 q3 t3 pattern is what you will have deep s wave in lead 1 and you have q wave and inverted t wave in lead 3 that is what is called s1 q3 t3 pattern and what is the okay what is the investigation of choice in case of pulmonary embolism anyone what is the investigation of choice it is not chest x ray chest x ray is not your investigation of choice what is the investigation of choice very good so investigation of choice will be ct pulmonary angiogram and you need to know three important findings in the chest x ray one is your hampton sum which is nothing but a wedge shaped infarct then you need to know the palas sign right what is this palas sign palas sign is nothing but prominent right descending pulmonary artery then you need to know the western mark sign and what is this western mark sign western mark sign is nothing but pulmonary oligemia that is what is called western mark sign okay next important is the d dimer so d dimer may be increased in all of the following conditions in pulmonary embolism definitely d dimer levels are elevated but apart from that the question is except so the question is in which of the following conditions d dimer is not elevated is the question anyone right so that is in case of no i did not get the correct answer from any one of you 
right that will be the anticoagulant therapy see when the patient is on anticoagulant therapy where is the question of the formation of a thrombus thrombus formation will not be there so d dimer is what it is a fragmented part of your thrombus when the patient is on anticoagulant therapy where is the question of thrombus there is no thrombus so if d dimer value is not increased when the patient is on anticoagulant therapy okay investigation of choice just now we have discussed that is tt pulmonary angiogram and what is the second best investigation second best investigation will be vp scan ventilation perfusion scan why because in pregnancy you cannot do ctpa right when you cannot do ctpa the next best investigation you need to know that is ventilation perfusion scan now i'll give you a clinical scenario tell me what is the treatment that you will do in this patient a young patient presented to emergency department with acute pulmonary embolism blood pressure of the patient is normal hmm? blood pressure of the patient is normal <coughs> but ecg reveals right ventricular hypokinesia and <coughs> compromised cardiac output the treatment in this patient is thrombolytic therapy anticoagulant with low molecular weight heparin anticoagulant with warfarin inferior vena cava filters yes very good very good medical doctor that will be thrombolytic therapy because see there are two indications for thrombolytic therapy one if there is hypotension you should do thrombolytic therapy or if the individual develops right ventricular dysfunction you should do thrombolytic therapy and that too he is a young individual he can withstand the thrombolysis but elderly patients you should be very much careful enough when you are doing thrombolysis otherwise if there is hypotension or right ventricular dysfunction then you have to do thrombolysis and what is the name of the criteria for your pulmonary embolism the name of the criteria is also a very very important question the name of the criteria is the wells criteria that is modified wells criteria and you have the various parameters parameters itself they can ask you the question so the parameters which are included is the signs and symptoms of deep vein thrombosis then alternative diagnosis less likely compared to pulmonary embolism heart rate more than 100 immobilization for more than 3 days past history of pulmonary embolism or dvt hemoptysis and malignancy these are the parameters of your wells criteria and to consider pulmonary embolism how much should be the score if the score of the individual is more than 6 that is high probability of pulmonary embolism right high probability of pulmonary embolism and if the score is in between 2 to 6 it is moderate probability of pulmonary embolism and if the score is less than 2 it is low probability of pulmonary embolism. it is low probability of pulmonary embolism so that is about your modified wells criteria okay so this finishes your pulmonary embolism and the next important topic is yes sarcoidosis the next important topic in the pulmonology that you should know is the sarcoidosis what is the hallmark see your sarcoidosis it's a non caseating granuloma and it's a multi system involvement and among all these multiple systems the most common organ which is affected is lung and what will be that pulmonary manifestation that pulmonary manifestation the most common pulmonary manifestation will be in the form of the interstitial lung disease or there can be development of pulmonary fibrosis followed by the lung the next most common organ affected in sarcoidosis is lymph nodes bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy is characteristic in case of sarcoidosis and the skin manifestation is very very important can anyone tell me what is the skin manifestation what is the skin manifestation this is called lupus perneo right lupus perneo and apart from this this another important skin manifestation is the erythema nodosum right erythema nodosum and what is the investigation of choice in case of sarcoidosis investigation of choice in case of sarcoidosis will be biopsy and what does the biopsy show it is a non caseating granuloma that is what you will see in the biopsy and you should know what is called garland striae and there are many names for this garland striae this is also called as 1 2 3 sign it is also called as pawn broker sign right so what exactly you will see in this garland striae you will have bilateral hilar lymph node involvement and apart from bilateral hilar lymph node involvement 
you also have right paratracheal lymph node involvement okay so that is what is called garland striate or 1 2 3 sign or pawn broker sign and the next important is the gallium uptake studies right next important is the gallium uptake studies so when you when you give gallium the gallium will be uptaken by the lacrimal glands and as well as the salivary glands when gallium is uptaken by lacrimal glands and salivary glands you get this classical panda sign right you will get this classical panda sign and when the gallium is uptaken by your hilar lymph nodes and paratracheal lymph nodes you get this characteristic lambda sign you get this characteristic lambda sign so you have two important signs one is your panda sign the other one is lambda sign okay then what is the drug of choice in case of sarcoidosis any one of you what is the drug of choice for sarcoidosis so the drug of choice for the sarcoidosis will be steroids that is oral corticosteroids should be given in case of the sarcoidosis okay and if the individual is refractory right that means there is no response with steroids so corticosteroid refractory disease in this case you need to give methotrexate in this case you need to give methotrexate or azathioprine or infliximab can be given so that is about your corticosteroid refractory disease okay so this finishes your important topics in your pulmonology right so now we will just have a break for 15 minutes then we will come back and discuss the connective tissue disorders and the remaining topics as well okay
all right so <clears throat> the next important topic yeah one important topic which we have forgot to discuss in the respiratory system will be the pural disorders that is the pure that is the pural effusion and as well as the pneumothorax so pural effusion like what exactly is that where there is excessive fluid in the pural space so what is very important to be known in case of pural effusion is the transurate and as well as exudate so in case of the transurate how much will be the protein content that will be less than 3 grams whereas in exudate it will be more than 3 grams per deciliter and how much will be the fluid protein to the serum protein ratio in transurate it will be less than 0.5 whereas in exudate it is more than 0.5 and how much will be the fluid ldh to the serum ldh ratio in transudate it will be less than 0.6 whereas in exudate it will be more than 0.6 so all these three together in case of exudate we call it by a criteria called as the lights criteria right so if any one of the following is there we consider it to be the exudative type of pural effusion now you need to know one important question that is therapeutic thoracocentesis that is therapeutic thoracocentesis should be performed if the free fluid in the lung separates the chest wall by greater than therapeutic thoracocentesis should be performed if the free fluid in the lung separates the chest wall by greater than any one of you 5 mm, 10 mm, 15 mm, 20 mm. Very good. So, it is 10 mm, that is 1 centimeter. Right, that is 1 centimeter. Okay. So, when the distance between the chest wall and as well as the lung, if it is more than 1 centimeter, then you need to do therapeutic thoracocentesis. And what will be the chest X-ray findings in patients with the pural effusion? The earliest finding will be blunting of the costophrenic angle. So this is the costophrenic angle that will get blunted. That will be the earliest finding. And the other findings are the presence of Ellis S-shaped curve. Right? Presence of Ellis S-shaped curve. And what will happen to the mediastinum? The trachea will be deviated to the opposite side. So this will be the chest X-ray finding. Then you take this chest x-ray suggestive of, can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis of this condition? Can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis of this second chest x-ray? So, the second chest x-ray, it is suggestive of the hydropneumothorax. Right, it is suggestive of the hydropneumothorax. So, in hydropneumothorax, you have the presence of the horizontal line. And on auscultation, in case of hydropneumothorax, what will be the characteristic finding that you will have? You will have succussion splash. You will have succussion splash. That is what you will see in case of the hydropneumothorax. Okay. Now, another important quick clinical scenario. A car accident patient complains of breathlessness. On examination, blood pressure is 110 by 70. GCS is 15 by 15. The trachea shows deviation in the suprasternal notch and there is reduced breath sounds in the left infraaxillary area and inframammary area. First and second heart sounds are normal in intensity and splitting. The chest x-ray is shown below. What is the best step in the management of this patient? Any one of you? So, what do you think is this patient developed? Needle aspiration you need to do, pericardiosynthesis you need to do, chest tube insertion, immediate thoracotomy. So, what is that you will do in this patient? Yes. So, very good. So, this particular patient has developed the hemothorax. Right? Secondary to the road traffic accident, the individual has developed hemothorax. So, how can you tell that the individual has developed hemothorax here? Because the left infra axillary and infra mammary area the breath sounds are reduced and trachea is also shifted to the opposite side that tells that the individual has developed hemothorax so when there is hemothorax by doing needle aspiration you cannot take out the fluid right you need to put a chest tube for taking out the blood so chest tube insertion is the answer in this question and when will you do pericardiosynthesis pericardiosynthesis you will do 
when there is cardiac tamponade so how will you rule out that the patient did not develop cardiac tamponade in case of cardiac tamponade first and second heart sounds will be muffled but our patient tells that in our patient first and second heart sounds are normal that will rule out your cardiac tamponade so pericardiocentesis is not required okay so what is that which is required here is the chest tube insertion okay next next important pleural disorder which is very very important is pneumothorax and what is the hallmark of the pneumothorax the hallmark of the pneumothorax it is the collapsed lung that is a hallmark of pneumothorax but very important you need to know in the pneumothorax is a tension pneumothorax which is an important medical emergency this tension pneumothorax can occur in the setting of a penetrating trauma it can occur in a setting of a lung infection it can occur in a setting of cardiopulmonary resuscitation it can occur even secondary to barotrauma right but in case of tension pneumothorax what will be the classical picture these individuals they will have hypotension jvp will be elevated the individual respiratory rate will be increased more than 30 per minute and what is the immediate treatment that you have to do immediate treatment that you need to do is wine wide bore needle aspiration right wide bore needle aspiration so that is what you have to do in case of tension pneumothorax okay and preferably like where we need to puncture the pleura you need to puncture the pleura in the second intercostal space according to the recent guidelines they have given like fifth intercostal space but in the clinical practice still we are following the second intercostal space and if it is asked in the exam you can just mention it as fifth intercostal space right then next you need to know that is the catamenial lung disorders what are catamenial lung disorders catamenial lung disorders it is commonly seen in females with pulmonary endometriosis right with pulmonary endometriosis so in these individuals they can have recurrent pneumothorax with every menstruation that is what is called catamenial lung disorders and how will you diagnose pneumothorax you will diagnose pneumothorax by doing a chest x ray right you will diagnose pneumothorax by doing the chest x ray so what will the chest x ray show chest x ray will show you the hyperlucent lung fields right chest x ray will show you that there is hyperlucent lung fields and what will happen to the lung the lung will be collapsed and what will happen to the mediastinum the mediastinum or the trachea is shifted to opposite side and when you take a chest x ray in supine position when you take a chest x ray in supine position in patient with pneumothorax you have this classical deep sulcus sign you have this classical deep sulcus sign that is what you will get in the chest x ray of a patient with pneumothorax when you take a chest x ray in supine position what is deep sulcus sign it is nothing but abnormally radiolucent costophrenic sulcus right abnormally radiolucent costophrenic sulcus that is what is called the deep sulcus sign now one important question related to pneumothorax is which of the following statements about pneumothorax is true which which statement is a true statement anyone breath sounds are increased percussion note is decreased always need chest tube insertion often needs chest tube insertion yes so please remember in case of pneumothorax it is not always needs chest tube insertion right it is often needs chest tube insertion and percussion note what will happen it will be a hyper resonant note right hyper resonant note percussion note will be increased and what will happen to the breath sounds breath sounds are decreased or absent in case of pneumothorax okay and what is the differential diagnosis for your hyper resonant note differential diagnosis for hyper resonant note will be emphysema so even in case of emphysema you will have this hyper resonant note so please remember they don't always need chest tube insertion they often need chest tube insertion right why is that because if there is small pneumothorax you don't require to keep a chest tube right it will undergo self resolution and the next important topic next to your pleural disorders will be your respiratory failure that was about your pleural disorders pleural effusion and pneumothorax next important topic is the respiratory failure okay so we have four important types of respiratory failure now answer this question 
all of the following types of respiratory failure they are correctly matched except type 1 hypoxemic respi respiratory failure type 2 hypercapnic type 3 atelectasis type 4 perioperative rate which is like incorrectly matched anyone right so the answer is type 4 type 4 it is not perioperative respiratory failure so type 4 is what it is secondary to a cardiogenic shock right it is secondary to cardiogenic shock and which is your perioperative respiratory failure then your perioperative respiratory failure it is nothing but type 3 respiratory failure so type 3 respiratory failure is your perioperative and in type 1 what will be the parameters there will be hypoxia and carbon dioxide levels they remain normal or they are reduced whereas in type 2 respiratory failure you will have hypoxia and there will be hypercapnia and type 3 and type 4 you will have the parameters similar to that of type 2 but only thing the etiology is different okay next now you see the next important clinical scenario in icu setting patients patient suffering from which of the following respiratory pathology is most predisposed for carbon dioxide narcosis motor neuron disease asthma emphysema bronchiectasis which of the following is most predisposed to carbon dioxide narcosis? Right. So, the patient who is more predisposed to carbon dioxide narcosis will be type 2 respiratory failure. So, among the options which has been given to you, which one will cause type 2 respiratory failure? That will be motor neuron disease. So, motor neuron disease, you have type 2 respiratory failure. Okay. Right. So, that is about your the respiratory failure. And I will show you one x-ray. Please tell me what is the diagnosis. What are the chest x-ray findings and what is the diagnosis in this chest x-ray? Yes. So, this particular chest x-ray, it is suggestive of, right, it is suggestive of No, 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 it is not hydropneumothorax. Hydropneumothorax, you have that high horizontal line and they will have like succussion splash. So, this is suggestive of lobar pneumonia. Hmm? This is suggestive of lobar pneumonia. And what is the most common organism that will be causing lobar pneumonia? That is your streptococcus pneumonia. Hmm? That is your streptococcus pneumonia. Okay, right. Next, I will show you another X. And what will be the respiratory sounds on auscultatory findings in case of lobar pneumonia? See, on auscultation, the respiratory sounds that you will have is the bronchial breathing. And what type of bronchial breath sounds you will have in case of uh, lobar pneumonia? That is, the tubular type of bronchial breath sound. Right? Tubular type of bronchial breath sounds. And we have another form of bronchial breath sounds that is called bronchial breath sounds. Bronchial breath sounds, you will have that over a cavity. And we have one more form of bronchial breath sounds that is called amphoric breath sound. Amphoric breath sounds, you will have that in case of tension pneumothorax. In tension pneumothorax, you have the amphoric breath sounds. Whereas in pneumonia, what type of breath sounds you will have? The tubular type of bronchial breath sounds you will have. Next, I will show you one more x-ray. What are the chest x-ray findings and what is the diagnosis in this case. Okay. Yes. Now, what are the abnormalities you are having? You are having consolidation or you are having opacities. But this particular opacities are not confined to one lobe. You have, right, multiple opacities which are distributed throughout the lung multiple opacities which are distributed throughout the lung and where will you come across this you will come across this in case of bronchopneumonia and in case of bronchopneumonia what is the most common organism the most common organism that is causing bronchopneumonia will be your staph aureus okay next i'll show you one more x ray right so what are the chest x ray findings and what is the diagnosis in this case so, if you observe the x-ray carefully, what is that particular pattern called as? 
this pattern you have that lacy pattern and this we call it as the interstitial pattern and you will have this pattern in case of the interstitial pneumonia or atypical pneumonia and what are the organisms that will be causing interstitial pneumonia just remember this bacteria that is mlc mycoplasma legionella chlamydia right mycoplasma legionella chlamydia and all these viral infections they also cause the interstitial pneumonia right next then next what are the chest x ray findings and what is the diagnosis so now this particular patient presented with dry cough and he has exertional dyspnea and he is also hiv positive and his cd4 count is less than 200 what do you think is this x ray suggestive of so this particular patient the organism causing pneumonia will be that is pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia in pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia in early stages the chest x ray may be normal but as the cvrt increases there will be classical ground glass opacity right there will be classical ground glass opacity and in case of pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia, what is the drug of choice? Drug of choice will be trimethoprin and sulfamethoxazole. And what is the investigation of choice? You need to do bronchoscopy and bronchoalveolar lavage. And in the bronchoalveolar lavage, you need to pick up the organism. And if you want to, these patients, they have like dry cough. And if you want to induce the sputum, you need to give hypertonic saline nebulization. And after giving hypertonic saline nebulization, you get the sputum. And that sputum has to be stained. And what is the stain we use? Gomori methanamine stain. The stain what we use is Gomori methanamine stain. That is what we will use in case of the pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia. So these are some of the important points related to pneumonia. And in the pneumonia, the next important thing you need to know is the CVRT assessment score. That is curb 65. So curb 65, it is the assessment of CVRT risk in case of pneumonia. Please remember the name of the score. That is curb 60. Okay. Next, then some important points related to the tuberculosis. So what are the various methods of the spread of tuberculosis? One is your droplet infection. So once the droplets, definitely it is the lungs. That is the most common organ which is affected. But the question that will be asked is, what is the most common organ in extrapulmonary tuberculosis? What is the most common organ in extrapulmonary tuberculosis? In extrapulmonary tuberculosis, the most common organ will be the lymph nodes, followed by that pleura and followed by that genitourinary tuberculosis. For example, the individual has developed tuberculosis by ingestion. If the individual has developed tuberculosis by ingestion, what is the most common site of tuberculosis within the intestine? The most common site of tuberculosis within the intestine will be ileocecal tuberculosis. Right? The most common site will be ileocecal tuberculosis upon ingestion and vertical transmission. That tuberculosis can be spread even from mother to fetus. And within the baby, which organ is affected first? The organ which is affected first in the baby will be the liver. Okay. The GONS focus is formed in the liver of the baby during the intrauterine life. Then the tuberculosis can be spread even by direct contact. And this direct contact tuberculosis, what do we call this as? we call this as lupus vulgaris, right, which is nothing but skin tuberculosis, right, which is nothing but skin tuberculosis. So, these are the four methods of the spread of tuberculosis. And next important question that will be asked is, what will be the most common site of Gons focus, okay. So, in primary tuberculosis, the most common site of Gons focus will be Lower border of the upper lobe. Lower border of the upper.
upper lobe that will be the most common site of bones focus and what will be the most common site of bones focus in secondary tuberculosis the most common site of bones focus or the fibrotic lesion in the secondary tuberculosis will be at the apex of the lung now this particular tubercular organism it spreads to various parts of the body right even within the lung you have supraclavicular focus you have infraclavicular focus so depending upon the spread you have the gons focus in multiple areas of the body and accordingly you need to know the names of these lesions so we have one particular lesion called pulse lesion so what is pulse lesion it is supraclavicular focus right it will be supraclavicular focus of the chronic pulmonary tuberculosis what is asthma and focus all these names are very very important that is infraclavicular focus and what is vigor focus it is the caseating metastatic focus in the wall of the pulmonary vein that is called vigor focus next is the simon focus what is simon focus it is the calcified focus of tuberculosis where in the apex in the apex and what is rich focus it is the tubercular focus within the meningitis that is tubercular meningitis right tubercular meningitis and what is the name of the tubercular focus in the liver that is called simon's focus simon's focus it is a tubercular focus in the liver and what is the name of the focus in the joints that is called Ponset's disease. So these are the various uh, foci in case of tuberculosis, and you should diagnose this chest X-ray. Can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis of this chest X-ray? So you can see the lesions. So how are the lesions? These lesions they are the size of the millet seeds, very small, tiny lesions which are present throughout the lung fields. This is what is called the miliary tuberculosis, right? Miliary tuberculosis, okay? And this miliary tuberculosis will give you a classical snowstorm appearance. So, what are all the various conditions you will get this snowstorm appearance? You will get that in tuberculosis, silicosis, hemosiderosis, varicella zoster pneumonia, and then pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. These are all the conditions where you will have this miliary tuberculosis. then what is the investigation of choice in case of tuberculosis investigation of choice in case of tuberculosis will be the gene expert right and this is also called cbnat what do you mean by the word cbnat cbnat stands for cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test the advantage of this cbnat is that it will also tell you about multi drug resistant tuberculosis right it will also tell you about multi drug resistant tuberculosis okay now you should know what do you mean by the word multi drug resistant tuberculosis yes any one of you please mdr tb is defined as resistance to right so what is the correct answer here mdr tb tells you it is resistance to isoniazid and as well as the rifampicin very good isoniazid and rifampicin okay next not only mdr tb like we have what is called xdr tb right the next important is the xdr tb that is what is xdr tb xdr tb stands for extended drug resistant tuberculosis yes thank you very much medical doctor right so what do you mean by the word extended drug resistant tuberculosis where the organism is resistant to isoniazid rifampicin quinolone and one of the injectable agent what is that injectable agent either capreomycin or canamycin or amikacin that is what xdr tb isoniazid rifampicin one quinolone and one of the injectable second line agent okay 
then you should know what are the genes which are being mutated for the development of this resistance. For rifampicin resistance, the gene which is being mutated is RPOB gene. For pyrazinamide resistance, the gene which is being mutated is the PNCA gene. And for INH resistance, the gene which is being mutated is the INH A gene. So, these are the gene mutations which are responsible for the development of resistance. Okay. And investigation of choice is what? Investigation of choice will be your CBNAD. It is not your sputum examination. Sputum examination, the sensitivity and specificity is less. And you should know what are the stains that we use for observing that bacilli. Can anyone tell me what is the name of the stains? What are the names of the stain? The name of this, we have two stains. One is your carbal fuchsin stain, which is nothing but your ZN stain or Zeal Nielsen stain. And the other one is the fluorochrome stain. And what is that fluorochrome stain? That particular fluorochrome stain is the ormine rhodamine stain. So these are the two important stains. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Nescafe Milk. Right. So these are the two important stains. And next important question is, see, you are very much aware of the first line antituberculous drugs and second line antituberculous drugs. But the question that will be asked for you is, what are the new drugs? The question that will be asked for you is, what are the new drugs? Yeah, anyone? What are the new drugs? So, the new drugs are like pretominate, right? Pretominid, then bidaquiline, right? Bidaquiline, and then dilamanid. Okay, so these are the new drugs which are uh, given for the tuberculosis. Okay, right. So this finishes your pulmonology. The next important topic for our discussion will be. The connective tissue disorders. Hmm? The connective tissue disorders. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. This image has slightly overlapped the question and as well as options as well. But anyways, I'll read for you that. So, the question is, 32-year-old man, women, sorry, long-standing diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus is evaluated by her rheumatologist as a routine follow-up. A new murmur is heard. And when echocardiography is ordered, this will be the or this is the echocardiographic finding. And she is feeling well, no fever, no weight loss, there is no pre existing cardiac disease also. Which of the following statement is true? Which of the following statement is true? Blood cultures are unlikely to be positive. Glucocorticoid therapy have been proven to be. Uh, glucocorticoid therapy will improve this condition. Pericarditis is frequently presenting concom concomitant manifestation. The lesions they have low risk of embolization. So, which of the following statements is true? So, can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis first of all? What is the diagnosis? So, diagnosis in case of SLE, what are that you are observing here? On the mitral valve, you can observe that there are hyper intense lesion, which are nothing but vegetations. So, what this individual has developed? Very good. This individual has developed Lipman Sachs endocarditis. And for Lipman Sachs endocarditis, do we give steroids? No. For Lipman Sachs endocarditis, the treatment will be valvuloplasty. Right, the treatment will be valvuloplasty, not glucocorticoids. For pericarditis, myocarditis, we give glucocorticoid therapy. But for endocarditis, you need to do valvuloplasty. And pericard, so your second option wrong. And pericarditis, it is not always a, con a concomitant feature. But whereas, if you take what is the most common layer which is affected, pericarditis is the most common manifestation in the cardiac involvement. But it is not always frequently associated with the endocarditis. 
and these individuals they have risk of embolization right so and what vegetations are these these vegetations they are sterile vegetations so that is the reason why blood cultures are unlikely to be positive so where will you have like uh, non sterile vegetations here non sterile vegetations you will see that in case of infective endocarditis right so here the answer is a blood cultures are unlikely to be positive that means the blood cultures will be negative because these are sterile vegetations okay and so what are the criteria for your sle the criteria for sle there are totally 11 criteria out of this 11 criteria four should be there right and the mnemonic is soap brain md so you can just remember it as you wash your brain with soap you will get an md seat okay so s stands for serositis that is your pleuritis or pericarditis o is oral ulcers a is arthritis but remember it is non erosive arthritis it is non erosive arthritis and p stands for photosensitivity this photosensitivity question has been asked recently in the inict exam b stands for blood disorders that is in the form of pancytopenia r stands for the renal involvement right that is lupus nephritis a stands for the anti nuclear antibody will be positive and that is the most sensitive antibody i stands for immunological uh, criteria that is anti smith and anti ds dna out of which which is most specific anti smith is most specific neurological involvement can be there in the form of seizures and psychosis and m stands for malar rash d stands for discoid rash okay and what is very very important in case of right what is very very important in case of the sle is antibodies so what is the most sensitive marker for sle that will be anti nuclear antibody and what is the most specific antibody that will be anti smith right that will be anti smith and drug induced sle what is the antibody that will be anti histone antibody and what is the antibody that is responsible for recurrent thrombus formation in SLE causing recurrent abortions? That will be anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome. And what is the antibody in SLE that is responsible for psychosis? That will be anti-ribosomal P. Right? Anti-ribosomal P. And what is the antibody that is responsible for causing photosensitivity? That is anti-Rho. Right? And what is the antibody that is responsible for CNS lupus? The antibody that is responsible for CNS lupus will be anti-neuronal antibody. Right? That will be anti-neuronal antibody. Okay? So that is about your SLE. And what is the drug of choice for SLE in acute episodes? that will be steroids right that will be steroids but steroids we don't give in all the forms of sle right the form of sle where we don't give steroids is endocarditis in lupus endocarditis we do valvuloplasty right we do valvuloplasty we don't give the steroids okay right so after having discussed about the sle which is one of the connective tissue disorder the next important connective tissue disorder is the ankylosing spondylitis yeah Yes, Ankit Pandey. In pregnancy, where there is recurrent abortions because of APLA, what we give is aspirin. Along with aspirin, we also give anticoagulants. That is low molecular weight heparin is given. Hmm? Low molecular weight heparin and aspirin is given if there is development of the APLA syndrome. And if there is psychosis, what we give for psychosis? We give haloperidol. Right, we give haloperidol. And for photosensitivity, what is that we will advise to the patient is sunscreen and we also give hydroxychloroquine. Right, hydroxychloroquine. Okay, so this will be the treatment in case of SLE. Now, after having discussed about the SLE, the next important topic in the connective tissue disorders will be ankylosing spondylitis. So, ankylosing spondylitis, what is the HLA in ankylosing spondylitis? That will be HLA B27. And in ankylosing spondylitis, there are two important articular manifestations, right? The two important structures which are affected is the spine, 
and the next important structure which is being affected will be the sacroiliac joint. So these are the two important articular manifestations that you will see in patients with the ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, and this ankylosing spondylitis it is a zero negative arthritis. It is not zero positive. It is zero negative arthritis. And what are all the other conditions where you have HLA B27? The other conditions where you will have HLA B27 will be just remember this pneumonic pair, right? What will be this pair? That is psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, then inflammatory bowel disease, and then Ritter syndrome or reactive arthritis. Hmm? Ritter syndrome or reactive arthritis. These are all the conditions where you will have HLA B27. Okay. Right. Then sober sign is used to evaluate. So these individuals with ankylosing spondylitis, there will be fusion of the vertebra. Right? There will be fusion of the vertebra. So when there is fusion of the vertebra, the flexion of the lumbar spine is affected. The flexion of the lumbar spine is being affected. So to assess the flexion of the lumbar spine, we need to do the Schober sign. Okay? And in these patients with ankylosing spondylitis, not only the joint manifestations, you also have extra articular manifestations. So what are the extra articular manifestations in ankylosing spondylitis? The extra articular manifestation, the most common extra articular manifestation that will be in the form of anterior uveitis. Anterior uveitis is the most common extra articular manifestation. Okay. Then followed by that, there will be lung involvement in the form of upper lobe fibrosis. Cardiac involvement will be there. And this cardiac involvement is in the form of aortic regurgitation, ischemic heart disease and third degree heart block. And even there is spinal cord involvement in the form of cauda equina syndrome and GIT involvement will be there in the form of inflammatory bowel disease and skin involvement will be there in the form of psoriasis. So this will be the extra articular manifestation in ankylosing spondylitis. And when you do, yes Abraham, that syllabus and the topics are uh, more or less same even for NEET PG and as well as FMG. So this particular revision will be enough even for NEET PG or even FMG as well. Okay. Right. I am trying to cover all the topics and that two important points in all the topics. Okay. This will be more than enough even for your NEET PG as well. Right. Next. So coming to the X-ray finding. So X-ray finding in the spine, you will have the fusion of the vertebra and that will give you an appearance of the bamboo spine. And in the recent FMG exam, what they have asked you is about the dagger sign. What is this dagger sign? This particular dagger sign is due to ossification of the supraspinous and as well as the interspinous ligaments. Right? Super, su, supraspinous and interspinous ligaments. Okay? So, that is what is your dagger sign. Next. How will be the sacroiliac joint? There will be destruction of the sacroiliac joint. Because even that is also gone. Then, coming to the treatment of ankylosing spondylitis. So what do you think is the first line treatment for ankylosing spondylitis? The first line treatment in ankylosing spondylitis will be the NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And those individuals where there is no adequate response, right, where there is poor response to NSAIDs, right, where there is poor response to NSAIDs, there we give TNF alpha inhibitors. So, NSAID resistant ankylosing spondylitis, we give this TNF alpha inhibitor. And we have some new drugs for ankylosing spondylitis. So, what are these new drugs for ankylosing spondylitis? That is interleukin 17A inhibitors. And what will be that interleukin 17A inhibitors? That includes Secuki Numab. And one more drug will be. Exeki Zumab. Okay, so these are the two important new drugs for your ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, so this finishes the ankylosing spondylitis. The next important topic is the rheumatoid arthritis. So, without discussing rheumatoid arthritis, your connective tissue disorders becomes incomplete. So, which of the following HLA association is specific? To the rheumatoid arthritis. Any one of you?
very good so that will be the hla dr4 association hla dr4 association and one quick question in ankylosing spondylitis which we missed is what is the cause of death in ankylosing spondylitis what is the cause of death in ankylosing spondylitis so the cause of death in ankylosing spondylitis is the fracture of rigid osteoporotic spine right the fracture of rigid osteoporotic spine that will be the cause of death in patients with the ankylosing spondylitis please remember this next coming to the rheumatoid arthritis so in rheumatoid arthritis what is the hla association that is the hla dr4 association okay next then followed by that in in rheumatoid arthritis what are very very important that you need to remember is the deformities so in chronic cases of rheumatoid arthritis the two important deformities is swanneck deformity and buttonhole deformity in swanneck deformity you will have the hyperextension of the pip and there will be flexion of the dip and in buttonhole deformity or botanese deformity it is exactly opposite where you have the hyperextension of the distal interpharyngeal joint okay then now one important differential diagnosis one important differential diagnosis for your swanneck deformity will be mallet finger deformity so mallet finger deformity is not seen in rheumatoid arthritis so this is due to rupture of extensor tendon so how will you differentiate that from swanneck deformity in swanneck deformity you will have hyperextension of proximal interphalangeal joint but here the proximal interphalangeal joint will be absolutely normal right but here the proximal interphalangeal joint will be absolutely normal you will have flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint that is what is your mallet finger deformity okay right then the other deformities are z line deformity and as well as the ulnar deviation and in case of rheumatoid arthritis please remember even the spine is also affected the spine which is affected in case of rheumatoid arthritis will be c1 and c2 vertebra right c1 and c2 vertebra that is atlanto axial dislocation will be there in case of the rheumatoid arthritis and because of which the patient will present with spastic quadriparesis okay then in case of rheumatoid arthritis do you have extra articular manifestations yes there is also extra articular manifestation what are what will be the most common extra articular manifestation the most common extra articular manifestation will be the presence of nodules over the extensor surface of the forearm and this will be non tender and you have many other extra articular manifestations and what will be the other extra articular manifestations within the eye there can be development of jogrens and scleritis within the lung there can be development of pleural effusion interstitial lung disease within the heart there can be pericarditis myocarditis and endocarditis and the most common valve that can be affected is mitral valve causing mitral regurgitation and kidney involvement will be in the form of membranous glomerulopathy endocrine involvement will be in the form of hypogonadism skin involvement will be in the form of rheumatoid nodules and even the cervical spine is affected that is cervical myopathy hematological manifestation will be in the form of normocytic normochromic type of anemia right so this will be the extra articular manifestation and you should know what is the cause of death in these individuals the cause of death in patients with rheumatoid arthritis that will be the coronary artery disease okay next you see the next question here a 45 year old coal mine worker presents with cutaneous nodules joint pain and occasional cough with dyspnea chest radiograph shows multiple small nodules in bilateral lung fields some of the nodules shows cavitation and specks of calcification most likely these features are diagnostic of very good that is your kaplan syndrome so what is kaplan syndrome kaplan syndrome is nothing but rheumatoid arthritis plus coal workers pneumoconiosis right rheumatoid arthritis plus coal workers pneumoconiosis and you should know finally what is the investigation of choice in case of rheumatoid arthritis any one of you what is the investigation of choice in case of rheumatoid arthritis investigation of choice in rheumatoid arthritis will be anti ccp 
right that is anti cyclic citrullinated polypeptide that may be the investigation of choice and when you take an x ray of these joints when you take x ray of these joints that will show you that there is periarticular osteopenia right periarticular osteopenia it is not rheumatoid factor rheumatoid factor is non specific right that is not the investigation of choice investigation of choice will be anti cc okay right so periarticular osteopenia is the x ray findings that you will see in patients with the rheumatoid arthritis and finally you should know what is the drug of choice for rheumatoid arthritis what is the drug of choice for rheumatoid arthritis that will be methotrexate right methotrexate will be the drug of choice okay right so that is about your rheumatoid arthritis the next important connective tissue disorder that will be behcet syndrome now behcets you need to know very very important question all of the following are the features of behcet syndrome except which of the following is not the features of the behcets which of the following is not the features of the behcets recurrent after stomatitis multi system involvement seen only in tropics common in youngsters so behcets yes seen only in tropics is an incorrect statement it is seen both in tropical and subtropical countries as well right tropical and subtropical countries and what is the hallmark of the behcets the hallmark of the behcets is there will be recurrent after stomatitis multi system involvement will be there in this behcets also and it is very common in the youngsters and what is another name for behcets the another name for behcets is orooculo genital syndrome right the another name will be orooculo genital syndrome okay and the age group at which you see this behcets it is commonly seen in youngsters that is around the age group of 20 to 30 years and i said you already they have hla association so what are the hla associations that will be hla b5 and hla b51 that is what you will see in case of behcets and in which country you will see this behcets most commonly most commonly it is seen in turkey right most commonly you see this in turkey and what are the characteristic manifestations we have discussed that is aphthous ulceration so this aphthous ulceration is the hallmark or sine qua non for the diagnosis of behcets and whenever the ulcers appear they are almost 3 to 5 in number and it is recurrent ulcers and this ulcers in the mouth that will be the earliest manifestation and they are very painful ulcers right they are very painful ulcers okay right and how will you diagnose this behcets in the behcets the pathology test will be positive right the pathology test will be positive in case of behcets and how do you treat these behcets one is your colchicin and then you can give topical steroids topical steroids they will reduce that mucocutaneous finding and the other one is the epremilast epremilast is what it is a selective phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor right selective phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor and it is fda approved for the treatment of the oral ulcers in case of the behcets right which is nothing but orooculo genital syndrome okay so this completes the discussion of some important topics in the connective tissue disorders right so with this i will wind up this session nephrology is there gastroenterology is there i will discuss this nephrology and gastroenterology in some other time in this two or three days i will discuss even nephrology and gastroenterology but except for nephrology and gastroenterology this completes the discussion and you just revise these notes that will be more than enough for your fmg exam right so with this i wind up this session please give me your feedbacks on my instagram handle and my instagram handle will be the rajesh gubba right and the annotation notes with annotations will be available on my instagram handle that is rajesh gupta right 
so thank you very much and i wish you all the best for your exam within another 2 3 days i will revise your nephrology and as well as gastroenterology as well thank you very much see you again